A Karen teacher in my math class took my inhaler because she thought it was a vape and refused to give it back during my asthma attack. Luckily, the attack wasn't fatal, but I still got that teacher in big trouble. Here's what happened. So last week was crazy. I'm a 15-year-old dude, and I'm a severe asthmatic. I use my inhaler like multiple times a day, just to breathe properly, you know? But during my math class, things went south real fast. So I was sitting in class, trying to pay attention to the teacher, but suddenly I started feeling like I couldn't breathe. You know that feeling when your chest gets all tight and you're gasping for air? That's what happened to me. I reached for my inhaler, the one thing that always helps me. So I took it out of my pocket and tried to take a few puffs discreetly. I know I should be using a spacer, but I don't want to get the class attention on me. And as you'd guess, the teacher heard me and grabbed my inhaler. What is this? Karen demanded, holding up the inhaler. Is this some kind of excuse? I've heard of kids using these vapes in school. What? No, it's my inhaler. I tried to explain, but my voice was coming out in wheezes. Oh, I'm sure it is, she said with a smirk. Kids these days will say anything to get their hands on a vape. I'm not falling for it. I'm keeping this. I was beyond shocked and terrified. My asthma was flaring up and I had no way to control it. Karen just stood there talking about the vaping epidemic and how kids today are all liars. It was one of the most embarrassing and dehumanizing experiences of my life. Thankfully, my asthma attack wasn't life-threatening and I was able to calm down after a few minutes. But I was still shaken up and terrified. I had social anxiety and didn't want to make a scene, so I just let Karen keep my inhaler and not make a big deal out of it. After the period ended, I decided to go to the principal's office and file a complaint. The principal, let's call her Miss Smith, was shocked when I told her what had happened. What do you mean she took your inhaler? She said she thought it was a vape and she wouldn't give it back to me, I explained. Miss Smith immediately confronted that bitch about the incident. The conversation went something like this. Excuse me, Karen, I just heard a complaint from one of your students that you took his inhaler during class. Is this true? An inhaler? No, I took his vape. Are you aware that he's a severe asthmatic and that inhaler is necessary for him to breathe? It's not a vape, Karen. Oh, come on. Kids these days will slay anything to get their hands on a vape. I'm just trying to keep the school safe. You know how it is these days. My principal confronted Karen and asked to see the inhaler. And when Karen handed it over, the principal was like, This is a medical device. How could you take it away from a student during an attack? This is where Karen realized what she did was completely unacceptable, causing her to realize she was in big trouble. This is completely unacceptable. You could have put the student's life in danger. He could have died. The principal then took the teacher out of the room and had a conversation with her. I came to realize she fired the teacher on the spot. She also apologized for what had happened and made sure I was okay. But seriously, man, what the heck? That teacher could have seriously endangered my life. I'm just glad it all turned out okay in the end. I've seen worse on the internet. Dude, this story from the OP is just insane. I mean, a teacher taking away a student's inhaler, life-saving device, because she thought it was a vape? That just sounds like something from a movie. It's hard to believe something like that happened being real. How ignorant can one person be? And the worst part is that it happened during a freaking asthma attack. Can you imagine? I mean, I get it, vaping is a big problem these days, but come on. Use some common sense. Also, I don't know how an inhaler looks like a vape. They look like two different things. I'm glad that teacher was fired. She should have had it worse, to be honest, but that's just me. My insane Karen mother went off the deep end and attacked my sister because she wasn't young and pretty anymore. Here's what happened. To start off with, my sister finished high school and has gone on to college, but my mother didn't take our sisters growing up well. You see, at first, mom was just acting sad and playing the victim after I'd forced her to see that she and my sister were not the same clothing sizes. Some said I went about it the wrong way by being so blunt by forcing her to see she couldn't fit into a coat my sister can. However, I really don't think there would have been another way to get through to her without involving the authorities, police, CPS, etc. After the incident, my 45-year-old mom was still dressing in clothes like a teenager at home and binge eating fast food and my sister caught her in her room trying to try on her clothes several times. Yes, our mother did destroy a few more pieces of my sister's clothing trying to put them on, but we confronted her each time. Rather than make her previous excuse of stating her belief that my sister and her were the same size, she would just lock herself in her room howling and crying to the point neighbors even once called police to do a wellness check. Of course, when police arrived, I saw a very different side of my mother. She'd put on a nightgown and did not look like someone who'd just been crying her eyes out. Not only was she pretending to act her age, she lied through her teeth and said that my sister had been the one making those noises because she'd been grounded for tearing up her mother's new clothes. I call this out as an outright lie, and she yelled at me to shut up. The police didn't know who to believe, but nobody was hurt, no threats were being made, and my mother wouldn't stop with the guilting waterworks that her children were so awful to her. So the police just issued a verbal warning and left. 
As soon as they were gone, my mother told me to get out, and that she didn't want me as a son anymore because I made her feel horrible about herself. I realized then that the loving mother she once was who raised us was completely gone, eaten by the narcissist before us then. Just a few years prior, she was a kind and loving mother, especially to my sister, but that obviously changed. There was a verbal altercation in which I pointed out to my mom's face how much of a narcissist she was being. Regardless of the size of her clothing, she didn't need to be trying on my sister's clothes. They were not hers. She wasn't even buying my sister clothes anymore. And if she wanted to disown me so badly, then fine. But I would also be disowning her. She threatened to hurt me again, in which point I told her to bring it on. She may be twice my weight, but she is not strong. And if she were to hurt my sister, I'd made damn sure she regretted it. My mother went back to howling and crying in her room after I said that, so I just left, but not before telling my sister to call me if she tries anything else. She hit the fan not long after my sister's 18th birthday in May. She went out with friends because her mother had hardly spoken to her in some time. She defectively disowned me and got no contact, and she was just biding her time to kick my sister out too. When my sister came home from her birthday party, she found herself in boxes and bags left outside the apartment she shared with our mother, and there was a note taped to the door telling my sister to leave and never come back. This would normally be the point where someone might say they were heartbroken, but the truth is that we were prepared for this. We knew mom wanted sister out because she refused to take mom's shit anymore, so she'd been secretly taking her stuff over to her friend's house little by little. This includes her personal documents for her identity, so all of her important stuff was out of there, and our mom just didn't seem to notice. My sister called me and I came over with my car to start packing up her remaining stuff to take to her friend's house. Since my sister was 18, she could go anywhere she wanted, and her friend's family took her in. And my sister lived happily there while she finished high school, and had a great summer before she and her friend both left for college. They'd applied to the same place and were accepted. They're some distance away now, but they are happy and living as roommates. But as so often is the case, there was trouble in paradise. I think our mother was hoping to pull some sort of emotional manipulation by kicking my sister out but it backfired badly since none of us even batted an eyelash about it. So mom started messaging my sister that she'd cut off her phone plan if she didn't speak to her. My sister responded by getting her own phone with money she earned working part-time and sent the old phone back to our mother in the mail with a letter telling her off for what she tried to do. Mom didn't take that well, but she no longer had a way of contacting my sister without trying to see her in person. So she came stomping over to my apartment to yell at me and say it was all my fault. Then she demanded my sister's new phone number. I told her to buzz off because she was no longer my mother. She'd previously made clear I was no longer her son. And if she didn't leave me alone, I'd be calling police. And then in a complete repeat of what happened on the day I'd forced her to see my sister was not the same size as her, she ran away howling and crying like an animal. But by then, I was pretty sure it was all an act. The next thing my mom did was show up at my sister's friend's house and then start demanding she move back in with her and contribute to rent because she was paying for a two-bedroom on her own and got no child support since my sister turned 18. Like me, my sister told her to buzz off. That's when mom attacked her. She grabbed my sister and started wailing on her while screaming that it was unfair that my sister got to be young, thin, and pretty, and that she wasted her youth being a mother. That's about as far as she got before my sister's friend's father took her down. He ripped her off my sister and threw her to the ground. The man is ex-Navy and built like a steamboat. He pinned my mother down and forced her into submission before calling the cops. He referred to her as a screaming wail for the sound she was making. My sister was taken to the hospital as her police arrived and took statements. The ring doorbell cam on the house had caught the entire fight, so the dad was in charge for taking down my mother as he'd reacted in defense of my sister. My sister was lucky and only had some bruises, a black eye, and a bump on the head. Our mother was a heavy woman, but she couldn't fight her way out of a paper bag. Mom ended up in jail, and she used her one phone call to try and guilt me into coming over and paying to have her released. I just said, I'm sorry, I don't have a mother. You must have the wrong number, before ending the call. She didn't ever call me again. My mother bailed herself out, but still had to go to court for attacking my sister. She ended up getting off with just a fine. She was also kicked out of her apartment by the landlord for several reasons, one of them being she tried to solicit herself to him, or so he says, but she denied it ever happened. So she was kicked out after a month or so, but she left a surprise for him. She'd spray-painted graffiti on the walls and smeared the bathroom with her own feces. The landlord called me over, and I saw the chaos she'd left. Thankfully, it wasn't as bad as I thought it'd be. Just some choice words for the landlord painted on the walls, and the bathroom mostly just had the mirror smeared. So the landlord didn't bother to call police. A cleaning crew had the apartment cleaned and repainted quickly enough. But from there, my mother spiraled worse. I heard she tried to pick up younger guys several times, and a friend tipped me off to where she was doing it. I found her in a bar across town. 
She was wearing pink hot pants a few sizes too small and tried to pick up a guy half her age, and she started calling him a vain little prick for not being interested in her. She was trying to claim to be 29 years old, but no one believed her. Then she saw me. She looked furious the second she realized I was there and started her howling back up as she stomped out. I ended up having to explain to a few people there that she was my mother and she's nuts. The bar manager told me he'd put her on the ban list because she was trouble every time she came in. The spiral went deeper. I really don't know what my mother was doing for a living, or even where she was living, as she'd gotten fired from her job and had no apartment. By this point, my sister was happily off to college, and people stopped seeing my mother around town. That is, until she was found dead in a motel room. She'd overdosed from drugs and died in late October. I was next of kin, so I was notified of some details. She'd heavily overdosed and also had a lot of alcohol and junk food in the motel room that she was binging on, so police were pretty sure she intended to die this way. When I saw her after she'd passed, she'd lost a fair bit of weight and looked like she'd aged 10 years in just a few months. It turns out she was suffering from an untreated STD and had likely been abusing substances for years. She'd pretty much destroyed her body from the inside out. In her final couple of years of life, she was the worst mother she'd ever been. Maybe from mental condition or from her drug use. We don't know. We'll never know now. The funeral for my mother was a little more than a very small gathering with an urn, and we'd spread the ashes at sea. There were no tears shed by either me or my sister, or even many words spoken. We ended up going out for ice cream and just having a talk before she had to drive back to where she currently lives, because she had class in the morning. I think it can be best described that we weren't happy mom had passed, but not sad about it either. If anything, I'm not really sure how to mentally process it other than the fact that it's just over and to move on. Currently, we have plans to meet at my sister's friend's parents' house for Christmas. My sister and I have no close relatives nearby, and since we were raised so far away from them, they're fairly indifferent to us. Always have been. My sister and I don't even have the same father. We don't even know who our fathers were. Mom never told us. She'd just say we didn't need to know because they didn't want to know us. So there's no point in seeking out a parent that didn't want you. But we're working hard to move forward in life. I've recently begun dating a nice girl I met while having a morning coffee, and we've been together for about three weeks now. Without my mom in my life, drama has been minimalized, and I'm rather thankful for that. I mean, attacking your daughter because she's grown up and isn't young and pretty anymore is just insane. The whole situation with the mother trying on her daughter's clothes, lying to the police, and then disowning both her children is just beyond belief. I can't imagine what it was like for OP to go through all of that with his mother, but the fact that he stood up for himself and his sister and made sure she was taken care of is just incredible. And now, his sister is in college, happy, and living life on her own terms. What do you guys think of this wild and crazy story? I thought I was in for a peaceful shopping trip when I went to buy maternity clothes, but I ended up in a heated argument with a woman who accused me of faking my pregnancy. As tensions rose and other shoppers looked on, I found myself trapped in a situation that I didn't know how to escape. Here's how it all went down. I was browsing through maternity clothes in a small clothing store, enjoying the chance to finally indulge in some retail therapy after a long week at work. The store was quiet, with only a few other customers browsing the racks. I was lost in thought, trying to decide between two different dresses, when I heard a voice behind me. You know, you don't look pregnant at all. You're just trying to get attention, aren't you? I turned around, confused and a little bit annoyed. Standing behind me was a middle-aged woman with short, spiky hair and a sour expression on her face. She was wearing a bright pink tracksuit and clutching a handful of hangers, as if she was in a hurry. Excuse me, I said, trying to keep my tone polite. I can tell you're faking it, the woman continued, ignoring my question. You're probably just trying to get free stuff. I blinked in disbelief. Was this woman serious? I looked down at my baby bump, which was clearly visible under my loose-fitting shirt. I'm not faking anything, I said firmly. I'm pregnant, and I don't appreciate your rude comments. The woman snorted and rolled her eyes. Sure you are. I bet you're not even really pregnant. You're just trying to scam people for attention. I felt my blood boiling. Who did this woman think she was accusing me of something like that? I took a deep breath and tried to keep my cool. I'm not scamming anyone, I said, my voice shaking slightly. I came here to buy some clothes for myself and my baby. If you don't have anything nice to say, please keep it to yourself. The woman scowled at me and stormed off, muttering under her breath. I watched her go, feeling angry and humiliated. Why did people feel the need to be so rude and judgmental? I took a deep breath and tried to focus on the task at hand. I needed to find some clothes for myself and my baby, and I wasn't going to let one unpleasant encounter ruin my day. 
As I continued to browse through the maternity clothes, I couldn't shake off the feeling of discomfort that the woman's comments had left me with. I had never been accused of faking my pregnancy before, and the experience left me shaken. I was lost in thought when I heard the woman's voice once again. Excuse me, miss, she said, clearing her throat. I think you have my dress. I turned around, confused. What do you mean? I asked. The dress you're holding, the woman said, pointing at the hanger in my hand. That's mine. I saw it first. I looked down at the hanger in my hand and realized that it was indeed the same dress that the woman had been clutching earlier. I had picked it up absent-mindedly, without realizing that someone else wanted it. I'm sorry, I said, handing her the hanger. I didn't realize it was yours. The woman snatched the hanger from my hand and glared at me. You should be sorry, she said. You're lucky I don't call the police on you for theft. I felt a surge of anger rise up in me. I didn't steal anything, I said, my voice rising. I made an honest mistake. You don't have to be so aggressive about it. The woman stepped closer to me, her face contorted with fury. Don't you dare talk to me like that, she said, jabbing a finger in my face. You're a liar and a thief, and I won't let you get away with it. I felt my heart racing as the woman continued to yell at me. Other shoppers had started to notice the commotion, and a few of them were staring in our direction. I tried to calm the woman down, but she was beyond reason. You're just trying to get attention, she spat at me. You're not really pregnant, you're just trying to scam people for free stuff. I felt a wave of nausea wash over me. This woman was relentless, and I didn't know how to make her stop. I tried to walk away, but she followed me, still hurling insults and accusations. You're a liar, she yelled. You're a thief. You're a scammer. I won't let you get away with this. I felt tears stinging my eyes as I realized that I was completely trapped. I didn't know how to get away from this woman, and I didn't know how to make her stop. I tried to reason with her, but she was too far gone. You're making a scene, I said, my voice shaking. Please, stop. I didn't do anything wrong. The woman just laughed. You're the one making a scene, she said. You're the one who's lying and stealing and scamming. I won't let you get away with it. I couldn't take it anymore. This woman, this Karen, had been hounding me for what felt like hours, accusing me of faking my pregnancy and stealing her dress. I had tried to reason with her, to explain that I was pregnant and that I hadn't taken her dress, but she wouldn't listen. She just kept hurling insults and accusations, getting more and more aggressive with each passing moment. I took a deep breath and tried to remain calm, even as Karen continued to hurl insults at me. I knew that I needed to find a way to defuse the situation before it got any worse. I tried to reason with her, using the facts to prove my innocence. Karen, please listen to me, I said, my voice shaking slightly. I didn't steal your dress. I picked it up by mistake, and I'm sorry for that, but I didn't take it with the intention of stealing. Karen just laughed. You're a liar, she said. You're a thief. You're a scammer. I won't let you get away with it. I took another deep breath and tried to remain calm. Please stop, I said. I'm not a thief or a scammer. I'm just a pregnant woman who wants to buy some clothes for myself and my baby. Can we please just put this behind us and move on? Karen looked at me for a long moment, her expression unreadable. Finally, she let out a deep sigh. Fine, she said. I'll let it go. But you need to be more careful in the future. And you need to learn how to control that temper of yours. I felt a surge of anger rise up in me, but I pushed it down. I didn't want to start another argument. Instead, I just nodded my head and walked away, feeling relieved that the situation was over. As I headed towards the checkout counter, I couldn't help but feel a sense of sadness and disappointment. I had come to this store looking for a peaceful shopping experience, but instead I had been confronted with hostility and aggression. It was a reminder that sometimes, no matter how hard we try to avoid conflict, it can still find us. But at the same time, I felt a sense of pride and strength. I had stood up for myself, even in the face of Karen's relentless accusations. And in the end, I had managed to defuse the situation without resorting to anger or violence. As I paid for my purchases and headed towards the door, I felt a sense of relief wash over me. The Karen encounter had been a difficult and challenging experience, but I had come out on top, and for that, I was proud. Karen really got what she deserved in the end. It's so frustrating when people like her make baseless accusations and refuse to listen to reason, but I'm glad that she was able to stay calm and eventually prove her innocence. This has nothing to do with me personally. A close friend of mine who we'll call Jake asked me to write his story here as he is not very good with words and doesn't know how to express his feelings well. He has autism, which was not diagnosed until he was an adult, and moved out of his mother's place and went no contact. His mother, whom I'll call Wacky Wanda, WW for short, has always treated Jake like a baby from the time he was born until he went no contact with her. He told me that as far back as he can remember, she would make him wear bibs at the dinner table and always hand feed him. She claimed it was because he was a special child that needed extra help. 
His father, Frank, would always criticize W for this, saying that he would never grow up if she kept babying him. She would get angry and tell him that he was being ridiculous and that she loved her baby boy so much, way too much if you ask me. Jake began to believe that he was developmentally challenged because of her. W would show up at his school and throw a fit when the teachers wouldn't pull Jake out of class to see her. He began to deal with bullying from other kids who would call him a mama's boy and tease him about wanting his mommy all of the time. As Jake got older, he started fighting back against the bullying. Eventually, he started yelling at his WW whenever she would show up and tell her to go home and to leave him alone. This never went over well, and he tells me she would sit alone in her room and pout, crying about how he had hurt her feelings. He would always apologize, and she would coo at him and pinch his cheeks and say that she couldn't stay mad at him because he was her baby boy and he was all she had in life, completely forgetting she had a husband, by the way. So manipulative. Once Jake was a teenager, he started acting out and becoming more independent from WW. Not all autistic people are built the same, and Jake is quite handsome. He rebelled by getting his dad to let him get tattoos, smoking cigarettes and pot, and hanging out with the goth morbid crowd in high school. He listened to heavy metal music and wore a leather jacket, eyeliner, and black nail polish. His black hair was always cropped short, and he smoothed it back with gel. Even without makeup, he was very good looking. And from the pictures I saw, I would turn my head to check him out. This gave him an ego boost. WW hated Jake's style and said it made him look like a clown and that his beautiful skin was too precious to destroy with tattoos and makeup. She threw away his clothes more than once, replacing them with clothes that she approved of. Frank would always take Jake to the mall so he could buy new ones, and Jake took pleasure out of throwing away the clothes W gave him. She would still make them eat dinner at the table every night. She was one of those women who was very traditional about family dinner. They always sat down, and she put a bib on Jake and hand-fed him his meal until he was finished. She would even wipe his face if he got anything on it. Jake noticed that whenever she did this, she would side-eye Frank with a smirk, like she wanted him to be jealous or something. Weird. The last time they ate together as a family, as soon as Jake sat down, she pulled out the bib. He tried to ask her not to do this as he was 16 and fully capable of feeding himself. She chastised him and told him to do as he was told. The bibs were too small and wouldn't even fit around his neck. He tried to tell her this, but she would just sit it on his chest, then start hand-feeding him by making airplane noises. Jake tore the bib off and told her enough was enough. He was 16 years old and didn't need to be fed like a baby. WW got upset and started whining. Frank suddenly blew up and told her to stop her behavior because this was getting too creepy, even for him to tolerate. He tried to support her in her worry that her son was getting older and no longer needed her, but this was too much to take. Jake went to his room and didn't come out for the rest of the night. DW pouted and cried for more than a day in hopes of making Jake apologize for refusing her, but he refused. She realized she was losing the battle with keeping her son a baby forever. Time to amp up the craziness. Jake came home from school the next day and found WW in the kitchen dressed up in all black with black eyeliner and lipstick, and she even dyed her hair black. She had spiked bracelets and a choker. She looked ridiculous. How I wish I could have seen a picture of this because it sounded hilarious. Jake was shocked and asked her what she was doing. He noticed the shirt she was wearing was cut way too low, and he could see way more cleavage than he was comfortable with. She bounced over to him and asked him if he liked it. He was too shocked to respond with what he wanted to say and said, Sure. For months after that, that was all WW would dress like. She would openly brag to her friends that Jake copied her style and she was so proud of him. She used to wear turtlenecks and mom jeans with slip-on shoes. She was the farthest thing from goth punk you can imagine. One night, Jake was asleep. She climbed into bed with him and tried to cuddle with him. He woke up and felt someone beside him. He turned around and saw WW. He freaked out and told her to get out of his room. She pouted and cried until Jake went to leave. He noticed his door was locked and he had to unlock it to get out. He had to lock himself in the bathroom and she sat outside the door, begging him to come back with her. Jake shouted at her that she didn't sneaked into his room and that it wasn't okay and it was weird she did this with the door locked. She screamed that that was how mommies show their love until Frank came out of their room to yell at her for the way she was acting and that it was creepy for a mother to want to cuddle her 16-year-old son with the door locked. She screamed that he didn't understand the bond she and Jake had and that he was jealous. Jake screamed that they had no bond. WW cried and Frank shouted at her to move away from the door or he would do something he might regret later. He took Jake and they went to sleep at a motel for the night. Jake told his dad everything that happened. Frank finally had enough. He couldn't stand the weird and creepy behavior from WW anymore. He filed for divorce and got custody of Jake and WW was given visitation rights. W was mandated to attend parenting classes and therapy and she actually went under the threat of losing any and all rights to her son of course. But she staunchly refused to believe she had ever done anything wrong. 
Jake dreaded visitation, but as he was still a minor, he had no choice in the matter. He would go and make sure to lock his door to prevent her from coming in. She did give him space when he was at her house, for a while. When Jake was 17, his dad paid for him to enroll in driver's education and got him a car. This went over poorly because WW got upset when Jake pulled up to her house in a brand new car. She lost it and called Frank to yell at him about how he was endangering her baby boy. He hung up on her. Things got worse once Jake started seeing a girl at school. She was a pretty blonde girl that dressed in similar fashion to Jake. When WW found out, she went insane. Jake was in his room sleeping and WW picked the lock. What Jake told me next made my heart drop. She climbed into bed with him in a thin nightgown. He woke up and freaked out. He ran away from the house and drove back to his dad's in tears and they called the police. WW got arrested and imprisoned for 11 years. Jake became severely depressed and his dad put him into therapy and he got better over time but he still struggles with everything his mother had done to him. Jake was formally diagnosed with autism and he is on medication that keeps him functional. He's one of the bartenders at my club and we're really close friends. He's best friends with my boyfriend Kyle. Jake has a girlfriend who is one of the sweetest women I've ever met. Jake and I have a connection because we both have experienced this from relatives and we both are stronger for having gone through that. Things got worse once Jake started seeing a girl at school. She was a pretty blonde girl that dressed in similar fashion to Jake. When WW found out she went insane, Jake was in his room sleeping and WW picked the lock. What Jake told me next made my heart drop. She climbed into bed with him in a thin nightgown. He woke up and freaked out. He ran away from the house and drove back to his dad's in tears, and they called the police. W got arrested and imprisoned for 11 years. Jake became severely depressed, and his dad put him into therapy. He got better over time, but he still struggles with everything his mother had done to him. Jake was formally diagnosed with autism and is on medication that keeps him functional. He is one of the bartenders at my club, and we are close friends. He is best friends with my boyfriend, Kyle. Jake has a girlfriend who is one of the sweetest women I have ever met. Jake and I have a connection because we both have experienced similar situations with relatives, and we are both stronger for having gone through it. Poor Jake, dealing with all that from his own mother. And then she ends up in jail? Wow, glad he's doing better now and has a supportive girlfriend. We all need people like that in our lives. My ex-in-laws and my ex showed up at my job during the biggest event of the year. Every year at my job, there is a Christmas-themed party. The dancers dress up as sexy elves, my boss dresses up as Santa, the bartenders dress up as reindeer, and the bouncers dress up as snowmen. The place is beautifully decorated as a winter wonderland with a huge throne for my boss to sit on and custom poles for the dancers to dance around him. It's a huge thing at my job, and it is always one of the highest-grossing nights of the year. It's advertised all over town that people can come, get their pictures taken with us, sit on Santa's lap, and enjoy a fun evening with customers. Custom Christmas music made by a DJ. We even have Christmas-themed drinks. I was excited for it because I started working there this year, so it was my first time being part of this event. I was dancing that evening, so I was dressed up as a sexy elf. I was feeling great. It was pretty late into the evening around midnight when this incident took place. I was dancing on stage when, out of nowhere, I heard the shrieking sound of my ex-mill crying. I turned around, and there they were. X-Mill, X-File, and Bill, my ex. X-Mill was slapping at Bill's arm and pointing at me. I couldn't make out what she was saying over the music. All I could hear was the shrill sound of her voice. I started looking around for Kyle, my boyfriend. I couldn't see him, but I did see other bouncers. So I waved at them, trying to get their attention. We have a special wave that when a bouncer sees it, they know to come running. Bill came to the stage and started shouting at me while the men around him were waving cash at me. He told me to come down and to come with him, that I was bringing shame to his family. I ignored him. I saw a couple bouncers heading for us, so I kept dancing, believing I was saved. That was the protocol. Call the bouncer and keep working to avoid making a scene. Then I felt someone grab my ankle and pull. In my panic, I fell and let out a scream. I looked up and it was Bill. He had pulled himself onto the stage and grabbed me. I started kicking at him with my other foot until the bouncers finally got there and pulled him away from me. I felt someone else grab me and I screamed again, but when I looked up, I saw it was Kyle. Bill and my ex-in-laws were taken into the office while I was taken backstage to ride out the panic attack. Kyle held me until I calmed down. The police were called, and I got to watch as Bill was forced into the back of a police cruiser in handcuffs. He's being charged with public disturbance, assault, and trespassing. My boss was talking to my ex-in-laws, telling them not to come back and warn them the police would be called if they did. 
Despite how angry he was, my boss was pretty calm and polite. I then heard Exmil shouting about how she was going to take me to court to take my children away from me because a godless person like me wasn't fit to be a mother. I couldn't take hearing that, and I rushed at her. Kyle had to grab me and stop me, but I was screaming at her that she was a psychopath and she would never get her hands on my kids again, that she had raised a lying, cheating, emotionally abusive person. She raised a hand to slap me, but the bouncers and police got between us. She and ex-Phil got into their car and drove off after being threatened with arrest. After calm had been restored, we all went back inside and resumed the party. I made good money that night. Even Samantha, my job's entitled gossip, couldn't deny what Bill and my ex-in-laws did was crazy. Over the weekend, I got a call from someone claiming to be Bill's ex-girlfriend, the one he cheated on me with. I asked her how she got my number and she said she had her ways. She said she decided to call me after Bill called her begging to get bailed out. She told me that during their relationship, ex-Mill treated her poorly and compared me and her a lot and always acted like she wasn't good enough. She was relieved when they went to Greece, believing her and Bill's relationship could be salvaged at that point, but she was wrong. Bill would also talk about me a lot, and she was always crying about being compared to his ex. When I got the job at the club, his behavior became more erratic. She told me that she confronted him after he was thrown out of the club because word travels fast and she heard about the whole thing. He got angry and slapped her, then threw her out of his house. She got him arrested, and he was fired from his job as a result. I thanked her for the information and promptly told her never to call me again. She asked me why, and I told her that she had no issue cheating with Bill and hurting his wife and kids, and that she was only calling me to get back at him for what he's done to her. I hung up and blocked her. I plan to go file for a restraining order today, but now I am armed with more information that will make the process so much easier and go so much faster. Wow, what a crazy story. I can't even imagine having to deal with all of that drama during a work event. Glad to hear that justice was served and that the ex-in-laws won't be causing any more trouble. And good for you for taking control of the situation and getting a restraining order. So, for a bit of context, I live on the east coast of the United States. I moved into a complex with a homeowners association, HOA. In exchange for paying the HOA fees, we receive many benefits, such as free parking, free use of the pool and gym, and other perks. There are too many individual stories to include in one post, so I'll focus on the story that involves my family. My parents went to the pool for the first time a few weeks after moving in. Before they even set their things down, a woman approached them. We had no idea what we were in for. The first thing she said to them was, Are you owners or renters? My dad asked her to clarify. They introduced themselves to each other, but the interaction left a bad taste in our mouths. What makes her stand out among everyone else is her accent. I won't disclose her country of origin, but I will say that she wasn't born in America, and her disputes with people can be somewhat funny to watch due to her thick accent. Eventually, we became friends with her, and she was very nice to us. But one day, she didn't show up to the pool. This was odd because if the pool was open, she was there, and she was always on time. Other neighbors told us that she was going to get scanned because she had some sort of growth in her thyroid. She came back, and things went downhill from there. After making friends with multiple families in the complex, my dad and I started doing handyman work for them. We did work for one older couple, and they loved it so much that word got out, and now we do work for many people in our complex. Eventually, we started doing work for our immigrant neighbor. My dad and her husband negotiated what we were going to do for them, and they came up with a plan and a price. When we arrived, they made us do a lot more work than we bargained for. It not only tired us out, but it also made us work for an additional two hours that we didn't agree to. My dad asked if they could pay us a little more for the extra work, and Karen left and asked her husband to deal with my dad. A massive argument ensued, and eventually, my dad and I just left. Her husband told her that he had threatened him, which he did not do at all. Trust me, I was there with him. She called my dad and they had a huge fight on the phone and they cut ties. Around the same time, I started making friends of my own. A boy similar to my age and his younger sister came up to me and we started talking. Eventually, the parents all started talking and we all became friends. The only problem is that they are really close with Karen. One day at the pool, she went on a rant and started saying really nasty things to my parents. She was sitting at the table with the mother of my new friends and she heard the whole thing. That day, we found out that she has anxiety because my mom went to the bathroom after the fight and saw her in the ladies' room crying. She came out and apologized on Karen's behalf. We are still friends with them to this day, but it can get complicated hanging out because they are always with her. Karen says all the negative stuff she wants about us to them. They all just shrug it off and tell her not to talk like that. Since I hang out with my friends a lot, my friend who is similar in age to me and who I see the most made my mom a card for her birthday. Unbeknownst to me, he put change in the card. 
My mom opened the card and gave him back the money saying, go buy yourself ice cream. We came back and his mom and Karen were talking. Karen had the absolute nerve to say that my mom was rude for not accepting his money. This upset my friend's mom and she made Karen apologize. They showed up at our house to do so. The only problem was that I didn't tell my parents what she said. So they were in for a rude awakening when they found out the hard way. My dad was angry and my mom was really upset. We went over to my friend's house a month later to celebrate his birthday and both parties had a talk about that incident as civilly as possible. Eventually, they moved out of the complex and into another one. We are all still friends, and they talk to Karen still. They even come as her guests to use our pool. They want to invite us, but Karen always tells them no and goes on her usual tirade. She's still a problem in the place to this day, yelling at anybody she crosses paths with. She can't go one pool day without snapping at somebody. Even my friend's parents tell her to stop as they fear she could get herself knocked out, or worse. In my state, that's a very likely possibility. Karen sounds like a real piece of work. It's crazy how one bad apple can really ruin the vibe of a whole community. But on the bright side, it's awesome to hear that them and their family were able to make some great friends despite all the drama. Here's to hoping Karen finds some peace and stops causing trouble for everyone else. I never imagined that a routine visit to the hospital would turn into a nightmare. When my daughter fell dangerously ill, Nurse Karen Nurse refuses to give her medicine because she's just faking it. Here's how it all went down. I never thought I'd find myself in a situation where the very person meant to provide care and comfort would become the source of my worst nightmare. It all started on a chilly Thursday morning when my daughter, Lily, woke up with a high fever and a persistent cough. I knew something was wrong, so I rushed her to the local hospital. That's where we met Karen, the nurse who turned our lives upside down. The hospital was bustling with activity, but it seemed to slow down the moment we met Nurse Karen. She was in her late 40s with a stern face that looked like it hadn't smiled in years. From the get-go, Karen was dismissive. Another overreacting parent, I suppose, she muttered under her breath as she led us to a room. I tried to explain Lily's symptoms, but Karen barely listened. Kids get colds all the time. She'll be fine, she said, barely glancing at Lily. As the hours passed, Lily's condition worsened. Her fever spiked, and she started having difficulty breathing. I was frantic, begging Karen to do something, but she just rolled her eyes. Look, I've been a nurse for over 20 years. I know a drama queen when I see one. She's just seeking attention, Karen said, her voice dripping with disdain. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. My kid is dying, I shouted, my voice echoing through the halls. Karen scoffed. Ew, she's just faking it. I've seen real sick kids. She's not one of them. Her words were like a slap in the face. How could a nurse be so heartless? I demanded to see a doctor, but Karen blocked my way. You're just going to clog up the system for a child who's clearly fine. Sit down and let me handle the real emergencies, she said, pointing to a chair. Then Lily started convulsing. Her little body shook uncontrollably, and she gasped for air. It was the most terrifying moment of my life. Help her, please, I screamed, tears streaming down my face. Karen finally looked alarmed, but still hesitated. Well, maybe she's not faking, she muttered, finally calling for a doctor. The medical team rushed in, pushing past Karen. They worked on Lily, giving her the medication she desperately needed. I watched, feeling a mix of relief and anger. Relief that my daughter was finally getting help, and anger at Karen for her negligence. The doctors managed to stabilize Lily, explaining that she had a severe respiratory infection that had quickly escalated. They were baffled as to why she hadn't received treatment sooner. I glared at Karen, who stood in the corner, her face void of the smugness it had held earlier. You almost let my child die, I said, my voice cold. Karen didn't respond, just turned and walked away. I was told later that she was suspended pending an investigation. It was a small comfort, but my focus was on Lily's recovery. Lily spent a week in the hospital, slowly getting better. The doctors were kind and attentive, a stark contrast to Karen's callousness. As we left the hospital, I couldn't help but feel a mix of emotions. Relief that my daughter was okay, but a lingering anger and disbelief at the cruelty of one nurse. I shared our story online, not for sympathy, but as a warning. I titled it, Karen Nurse Refuses to Give Medicine to My Dying Kid Cause, She's Just Faking It. The response was overwhelming, with many sharing their own stories of medical negligence. As for Karen, I heard she was eventually fired. Some said she deserved it. Others argued she was just a product of a stressful healthcare system. But to me, she was a reminder of how one person's apathy and arrogance could have cost my daughter her life. I hugged Lily a little tighter that night, grateful for her recovery but haunted by the what-ifs. Karen's face, twisted in disdain, would forever be etched in my memory, a chilling reminder of the day my world almost shattered. That's absolutely horrifying. I can't believe someone in the medical profession could be so heartless and negligent. Poor Lily and her mom went through such a traumatic experience, sending love and healing vibes to them. 
Thank goodness the doctors were able to step in and save her. This story is a chilling reminder of the importance of compassion and empathy in healthcare. Stay strong, Lily and her mom. I thought I had it all. A loving wife, three beautiful daughters, and a seemingly happy family. But behind closed doors, the facade crumbled, revealing a world of neglect, indifference, and secrets. As I spiraled into despair, questioning my place in their lives, a series of unexpected events unfolded. Here's how it all went down. I have been married for 15 years. I have known my wife since I was 8. We have three daughters together, age 17, 14, and 11. I'm tired of feeling like I'm an outsider in my relationships with all of them. I'm just an ATM and taxi service to my kids. My wife hasn't kissed me in six months. She has not said that she loves me in 1.5 years. No matter how much I communicate, try to plan anything, or do anything, it is always shot down, forgotten, or dismissed. I don't get angry, I don't yell, and I don't get physical. I like to splurge during birthdays and Mother's Day. I throw parties and give gifts to try to show how much I love them. I get a lukewarm thanks, and if I'm lucky, a side hug that lasts for a fraction of a second. This week was the breaking point. On Father's Day, I wake up to an empty house. It was odd. No note, nothing was written on the calendar, and nothing was said beforehand. I send a text, and I get back. I took the girls out for a spa day, don't wait up. Then nothing, literally nothing. Dinner time comes around, and they get home. I ask how their day was, and it was fine. I ask what they would like for dinner, and they say, nothing, we already ate at one of my favorite restaurants. Cool, whatever. There is no mention of it being Father's Day. No, I love you. No, how are you? Nothing. Fast forward to Wednesday, which was my birthday. Nothing. Literally again, nothing. I suggested plans, but they were shot down. I suggested getting food, but that was also rejected. I asked about watching a movie, but everyone was too busy on their phones doing nothing. Now let's move on to Thursday night. I'm in bed and my wife is next to me. She rolls over and says in a crappy tone, Oh, your birthday was the other day. I guess you expect to have sex. That broke something inside me. To the best of my memory of how it went down, I replied, No, I don't expect sex. At this point, I don't expect anything anymore. She asked, What's that supposed to mean? So, I started asking her questions. When was the last time we shared a kiss? Like a week ago? No, it was in December during her parents' holiday party. When was the last time we had sex? The beginning of the year? No, it has been over a year. She insisted that we did it in February, but I was dealing with my mom's health and her passing. So I said something like, You may have had sex, but it wasn't with me. When was the last time you said you love me? I say it all the time. Not to me. Check your messages. You don't say it to me face to face. Well, you should just know I do. When was the last time we went on a date? Long pause. She responded, You're being unfair. My emotions were fully turned on. I was crying and raising my voice at this point. I asked her how I was being unfair. She couldn't answer. I asked her how wanting any sign of love from anyone in the house was unfair, if expecting anything for my birthday or Father's Day was unfair. She had an oh shit look. Yeah, she had forgotten about Father's Day as well. I'm not an ATM, I'm not a taxi service, I'm not a punching bag. She asked why this was coming up out of the blue. It didn't. I have tried to talk to my family and again get dismissed or ignored. I gave examples. I got an, I didn't know you were serious. I didn't know it was such a big deal. I left by saying something like, if you want to pretend that I'm invisible and don't exist, fine. You don't have to pretend anymore. I left the house almost at midnight on Thursday, Friday morning and haven't been home since. I'm not sure what to do now. I'm finally sober enough to think, but I don't know what to do. By the way, it's the first time I've been drinking in over 15 years, and I'm not going to drink anymore. I love my family, but I can't keep this up. I don't know what more I can do. I think they would be happier without me. They already act like I don't exist. I can't be the one who is blamed for everything. If I truly am the problem, then me not being there should fix it. I can't do it anymore. I have received only one message from my wife. I'm sorry for making you feel that way. We all love you and we are here for you when you want to come home and talk. That's it. No other messages. No calls. Nothing from the kids. I feel like if they really wanted me there, they would try reaching out more. All of the kids have their own phone. I don't know what she told them. I'm sure they heard me raise my voice. Me raising my voice would have definitely got their attention since I never do. I'm sure they heard me leave. I just don't know. I reached out for help through my workplace, which offers resources for therapy and legal counsel. Unfortunately, my boss discovered my efforts and has been persistently interfering, but that is not the focus here. I believe she has good intentions. Fortunately, I was able to schedule an appointment with a therapist relatively quickly, despite my initial expectation of a long wait list. The therapist recommended a family spousal therapist who specializes in individual counseling. I had a discussion with this therapist as well. I was also referred to divorce lawyers. Although I am hesitant to pursue that route, I spoke with them to gain an understanding of the process. It seems that I may face challenges, but since we live in an at-fault state, 
If it turns out that my spouse is cheating, it might work in my favor. After a few days, my children reached out, expressing their concern. I reassured them that I am fine and that I love and miss them. However, I explained that I needed some space and time. For the first time ever, I missed some of their extracurricular activities, which made them realize that something was seriously wrong. Other family members and so-called friends also noticed and started asking questions. My kids mentioned how things were not the same without me and how my wife was struggling. My wife reached out to me several times, checking in, apologizing, providing updates, and even asking about our usual 4th of July party, BBQ. I declined her invitation, but I insisted that we needed to have a private conversation in person. This conversation took place the weekend after the 4th. To my surprise, my wife brought the kids along when we met. I was happy to see them, and they seemed happy to see me too. However, I requested to speak alone with my wife. When I pointed this out, she insisted that the kids should be present because they missed me. I believe this was a manipulative move on her part. During our conversation, I expressed how my feelings and desires have been consistently ignored and dismissed. I highlighted that I have been overlooked for a while and this treatment is unacceptable. Although my wife kept apologizing, I made it clear that I did not accept her apologies. Most of the apologies felt insincere, such as her initial apology of, I'm sorry you feel that way. They seemed forced, as if she was only saying what she thought I wanted to hear. Actions speak louder than these empty words. I also emphasized that my wife's behavior sets an example and establishes expectations for how I should be treated, as well as how our daughters will perceive and treat me in their future relationships. At this point, I believe my wife regretted involving the kids in our conversation. While my 14-year-old took my 11-year-old to get some snacks, my 17-year-old stayed with us. I directly asked if there was anyone else involved, if she was cheating physically, emotionally, or otherwise. The question caught her off guard and she appeared shocked. She vehemently denied any infidelity. I questioned why she had been so insistent on having sex with me back in February. My daughter had left the room by this point, when it had been much longer since we were intimate. I asked why every aspect of our romance had deteriorated within a year from her side. She had no answer. We continued our conversation for an additional 20 minutes. At that point, I took out two folders that I had brought with me. One contained a separation document, a step towards divorce. The other contained referrals for individual and couples therapists. I wanted to convey the seriousness of the situation and asked her to review the information and consider what she wanted. However, I made it clear that she had to make the decision and schedule the appointments herself. I explained that I refuse to continue living in this manner, and if she chooses to stay with me, significant changes need to occur in our relationship and our home. I still love the woman I married, the mother of my children, and the partner with whom I built a life. However, I feel like I have lost sight of who she has become. My kids returned, and my 11-year-old was upset that I wasn't going back home with them that night. I gave my wife some time to think. The following day, she contacted me and informed me that she had made appointments for herself and for us. She scheduled bi-weekly individual therapy for herself and our first couple's therapy session for early next month. The reason for the delay was so that she could focus on herself first. I have been using the gray rock method towards her since the initial incident, as recommended by both you and our therapist. Overall, it's still a work in progress. I'm not in as dark of a place as I was when I first reached out. Some things have improved. I'm willing to put in the effort, but it cannot be one-sided. We have a plan moving forward, which is a positive step. I have been back at home for a week now, but I am sleeping in a different room. Some changes have already been implemented, but time will truly test the effectiveness. On a side note, on the second night of my return, my wife attempted to initiate sex, but I declined, explaining that it was not the appropriate time or place. We have many issues to work through before that can happen. As always, peace, love, and chicken grease. I feel like they would be happier without me. They already act like I don't exist. I can't be the one who is blamed for everything anymore. I can't do it. I keep going over and over in my head. If I was gone, then their problems would be solved. They could move on with a new dad slash husband who they would love more than me, who they would show more love than they have shown me. I was the cause of everything that went wrong in their life. My wife probably has a replacement who could just step in and be a real dad and husband to them. Something snapped me out of it. It still sounds weird, but it was as if I could see here my 11-year-old. She has been the one who has made me feel loved, wanted, and cared for throughout most of this, both before and after I left. From what I now understand, my wife was pushing for them to give me space, but my youngest wouldn't accept it. She kept pushing for them to reach out, track me down, and find me. She had a weird feeling. I initially hid the fact that I was at the point of ending things from my therapist. After my last update, I told her. She could tell I wasn't as open with her until that point. That changed the tone of our sessions. 
I have a better understanding and more tools I can use to recognize and help deal with those negative and dark emotions. With that came some diagnosis. On to my wife. She did commit to her individual therapy. I started to see some changes in her. She has been treating me better. Things were going in a more positive direction. I still shut down forward advances from her. I found out her therapist was also telling her to stop and earn my trust, and that we had to rebuild up to that. But that makes her feel unloved and unwanted. Ironic. I looked into it to see if she was cheating and I found nothing. No texts, messages, emails, unexplained expenses, weird locations, absences, photos, apps, nothing. So she is either really good at covering her tracks, or she didn't cheat. I expressed that if it ever came out that she did cheat on me, it was over. The first couple session was a long one. The first hour was individual with me, then my wife, then both of us. It was useful and helped, but not much. Same with the second session, which was two hours together. The third was a shit show. This was just after I opened up with my individual therapist about my self-harm thoughts. I just opened up to them and told them everything, where my head was at, my thoughts at the time, how close I came, what stopped me, how long I had thought about it, everything. My wife looked at me with a sense of horror. She looked at me and started yelling and kept repeating, how could I, me, OP, be so selfish? The therapist calmed her down and I started talking again. I went deeper into how badly my wife and kids hurt me. That there is no way she didn't know about Father's Day or my birthday. How I still suspect that she has been cheating on me. How the dark thoughts started after my mother passed away and my wife stopped being my wife. I don't know what happened to my wife. The woman I loved disappeared. She has been gone for a while. Checked out. My wife was loving, playful, honest, trustworthy, a fantastic partner, and the love of my life. I can't be with this stranger she became. I just went off and unloaded. The therapist said we needed a break to cool down and meet back in five minutes. I walked out. I know it was being immature, childish, and an AH move. When I cooled down enough, I saw I had a bunch of missed calls and texts. My 17-year-old ended up picking me up since my car was at home. It was the first time she saw me actively cry. I think that got her to understand how much weight was crushing me, how much their actions have caused me pain. We ended up parked somewhere and just talked. We talked for a long while, more than we had in a long time. I got more out of that conversation than I have in the last few years. We got back home and my other two kids ran to me and hugged me. Not just a side hug, but an actual hug. That felt so good. My wife approached me slowly and asked for a hug as well. I gave her half of one, and she started crying. We, as a family, hung out for a while, and when bedtime came around, my wife asked to talk. She did say that she thought she was losing me around when my mom passed, that I had checked out of our marriage, but didn't go into detail. She said she is still working through some things, and when she has a better understanding of herself, she will bring it to the table. She then broke down. She said that she really didn't know how bad it was. She is sorry, but vowed to do anything she can to make it up to me and be a better partner. She is trying. I do see improvement, but why did it have to get to this point? But now I'm so numb that I keep asking myself if she really meant that, or if they are just empty words. I don't know if that is the medication talking, or how I'm thinking nowadays. Some days I feel like my mind is like when an old TV has static because of bad signal. My kids overall are doing better. I still question the older ones sometimes, but I think it's me overthinking. School and activities are keeping them busy. But one thing that keeps bothering me is I can tell they are walking on eggshells around me. It bothers me. It's like I'm a jack-in-the-box, and they are waiting for me to pop out at them. Therapies is helping overall. It just takes time. My therapist said it is like I've been an actor playing a character for so long that I don't know how to be myself. I don't know if that makes sense to anyone else, but I feel the truth in it. I need to find myself first and then work on other relationships. My wife and I did go on a date. She planned it, and it was fun. I had a genuine smile. But in the back of my mind, I was wondering if this was for me or for us. I'm not sure what will happen in the future. Time will tell. And that's the story of a man who had to confront his deepest fears and face the cracks in his relationships. It serves as a reminder that open communication, understanding, and genuine love are the cornerstones of any healthy and fulfilling connection. Life is unpredictable. But with time, patience, and a willingness to change, there is always hope for healing and finding a way forward. In the midst of a strained relationship between my wife and her estranged son, a devastating phone call reveals that he is terminally ill with only a month left to live. Despite my urging, my wife refuses to visit him, torn between her own fears and unresolved emotions. As her husband, I grapple with the guilt of pushing her towards a heartbreaking decision. Here's how it all went down. My wife Sarah, 39 years old, has a son Vicky, 20 years old, from her previous marriage. Because of the way my wife and I got together, there was a lot of strife in her divorce from her ex, resulting in a difficult time for Vicky, who was only 8 years old at the time. For a few years, my wife tried her best and made every effort to help him, 
but it seemed that the more she tried, the more distant he became. The situation reached a breaking point when he was 12. My wife caught him trying to smoke and when she intervened, he almost broke her jaw. After that incident, she decided to stop forcing custody and let him stay with his dad. When Vicky was 14 and we had our son, my wife sent him a message informing him about his baby brother's birth. She emphasized that even if he didn't want to be around her, it didn't mean he couldn't love his brother. Unfortunately, Vicky responded with a disrespectful phrase. She tried the same thing three years later when our daughter was born, but this time she received no response. Well, two days ago she got a call from her ex, and he was crying and apparently Vicky is dying. He has cancer and they found it very very late, and he's optimistically only got a month left, and he's been begging to see her. So I've told my wife to go and spend the month with him. She can work online for a month or take a leave or just quit if they don't understand. However, she's refused, and she's used everything from work to needing to take care of our kids to even what if it's just a trick to hurt me more as excuses not to go. At the same time, she keeps crying, muttering about thinking she had more time, ignoring our kids, looking at old photo albums of her and Vicky. It came to a head this morning when I caught her having a breakdown in her car before going to work. I begged her to reconsider when I saw, and she called me a jerk for trying to push her into going. I know he's not my son, and I have no right over him, but not going is tearing Sarah apart. So am I the jerk? To clarify for everyone who is confused, there were more than just two instances when my wife reached out to ask if he was ready to see her. The only time he responded was when our son was born. She continued to try reaching out until his graduation, even with his father's encouragement to invite her. She sent him money, presents, and everything for his birthdays. Regarding the incident when he struck her at the age of 12, he used a hockey stick and kicked her when she fell. She forgave him because she understood what he was going through, and he is her child. However, she decided to stop seeing him at that point because she didn't want her presence in his life to contribute to his violent behavior. She worried about the possibility of him harming another child in the same way. To those suggesting therapy, yes, she did take him to therapy and tried her best, but he was unresponsive at that time. My stepson Vicky passed away a week ago, and I feel the need to express my emotions and thoughts here as people were willing to listen before. After my wife came home on the day I posted, we had another intense argument about the situation. I felt like I couldn't get through to her, despite using some of the points that people in the comments had shared with me. I was surprised by her stubbornness. The argument ended with her screaming at me, claiming that her son wasn't sick, dying, or in any danger. I don't know if she was in deep denial or thought it was some kind of trick, but her screaming frightened our children. I felt it was best to let it go. A few days later, my wife received a call from a young woman claiming to be Vicky's wife. She begged my wife to come and this prompted my wife to take action. Her understanding colleagues at work granted her time off until the end of this month. My relatives came over to help me with the kids, as my wife made it clear that she had to handle this on her own. She flew to where Vicky's family was staying, booked a hotel, and went to see him. She hasn't shared all the details with me as she only returned home two days ago. According to her ex, their son started behaving oddly around the time he graduated from high school. They didn't think much of it at the time, as he seemed more mature. They arranged his marriage in India about six months ago, with no objections. Her ex blames himself for not realizing that the change in behavior was due to an illness. My wife told me that they married him off because his wife is the only child of a wealthy family. What has caused my wife to cry repeatedly is that nobody informed her about her son's wedding. She keeps saying that if she had known he was sick, she could have saved him, and she should have been there. I agree that her ex deserves blame because her own relatives don't communicate with her. She doesn't use Facebook, and she had a right to know. Regarding her daughter-in-law, my wife only has positive things to say. She is studying engineering at the University of Alberta and is currently pregnant. This brings my wife some hope. She believes that a part of her son is still alive through his wife, and I'm glad they can support each other. As for the details about my wife's son, she hasn't shared much with me. She mentioned that he was sad kept apologizing for his behavior and forgetfulness, and that his condition made her feel like he was already gone before she arrived. She did tell me that he passed away in her arms while she was praying, so I hope that means they were able to reconnect. I understand that she may not want to share this with me, but it frustrates me. I have always wanted my wife to have everything she desires, and I know that having her son back is what she wants the most, as he was her heart. Now she can't have that. It's not like losing an estranged parent or sibling. He was her son, and she gave birth to him. I see her crying and saying it should have been her, and it honestly angers me. All I can do is be there for her, but I feel like I shouldn't have to be, as her son shouldn't have had to die so young and tragically. By sharing this heartbreaking story, I hope we can all reflect on the importance of family, forgiveness, and the preciousness of time. Life can take unexpected turns, and it's a reminder to cherish our loved ones while we have the chance. I received a request for child support from a woman I've never met 
and I knew something was deeply wrong. As a biological cisgender woman with no children, I couldn't comprehend how I was being sued for something I couldn't possibly be responsible for. Little did I know this was just the beginning of a twisted plot that would lead to a shocking revelation. Here's how it all went down. A few days ago I received a notice from an attorney that I am being sued for child support from a woman I have never met or heard of. Context. I am a biological cisgender woman. I am straight. I have zero children. I have never done surrogacy, egg donation, or even given birth or come close to it. I contacted the attorney listed on the document, a fairly well-known attorney around where I live, to make sure it was legitimate, and yep, it's legitimate. He stated that his client came to him to sue me for backdated and future child support for her 15-year-old and stated that I am the biological father. The attorney had my name, address, and information like my birthday, where I went to high school, etc., yet somehow didn't know that I am a woman? The attorney also stated that the woman is in her 40s. They repeated her name to me and asked if I knew her. I responded by stating that I have never met or heard of her. I clarified that I am a biological woman who has never had a child. Furthermore, I raised the point that if I were a man and the biological father, she could potentially be in trouble for statutory rape, as I would have been barely 15 years old when the child was conceived and she would have been in her mid to late 20s. The attorney explained that, as an attorney, they have a duty to follow through. They insisted that I need to meet with them, sign the documents, and undergo a DNA test to confirm any relation to the child. I informed the attorney that it is physically impossible for me to be the father. However, they remained adamant and instructed me to bring my own lawyer to their office tomorrow. I am unsure if I actually need to hire an attorney. Can I simply go to the meeting and assert that I am a woman who has never given birth and asked to be left alone? I am in need of proper guidance on what steps to take next. First, I will answer some questions. No, I do not have a masculine slash gender neutral name. In fact, I have a very long and uniquely spelled feminine first and middle name. Yes, I have brothers. None of them have passed away so I wasn't being sued in their place. They are all alive and well, and it is easier to get in touch with them than with me. I am not on social media, but they are very active on various platforms, such as LinkedIn, and have public pages. They can be easily found through a random Google search. Yes, I also have a father. However, he is not the one I was being sued for child support on behalf of. In the beginning, this woman stated that I didn't have any family at all. She told the attorneys, I can give him the family he's never had since he's been alone his whole life, referring to me as he. Even if one of my brothers was the father and we did a DNA test, which we didn't, there would still be no way to prove that I am biologically related to this child, as I am adopted. The only relation I have to my siblings is because my parents signed a piece of paper and picked me up from state custody. Additionally, if she were trying to set up the DNA test to prove a familial link to the child without the father present, she should have gone to my sister, who is biologically related to the rest of my adoptive family, as she was adopted from another family member. No, thankfully, I have not been a victim of identity theft. The person involved in this case was not posing as me. Fortunately, there was no attempt to change the paperwork from the biological father to the mother. Even in the documents presented by this woman's lawyer to my attorney, and the documents I received, it clearly stated that I was supposedly the biological father. Now, as to what happened, I went to the attorney's office with my attorney as he requested during our call yesterday. And guess what? The suit was dismissed. It happened very quickly. Thank goodness. I thought we would meet with a judge because that's how I assumed it worked. But we went to the lawyer's office and met with him and the woman who filed the suit. I got an attorney as I reached out to a friend who lives in my state as a lot of his family are attorneys. One of the families where it's in their blood, basically. Turns out, his aunt handles family cases. He got me in touch with her and we spoke. After I told her the situation, she laughed and said she'd do it pro bono just for the entertainment. Apparently, she knows the other attorney and says he's a jerk, so I guess that's a benefit for me since she was more than happy to represent me. We met with the attorney, showed my birth certificate, Idaho, passport, adoption papers, and my initial birth certificate prior to adoption, for good measure. The attorney was frustrated with his client, but very kind with myself and my attorney about it. He apologized for the inconvenience. The entire matter was dismissed. Initially, my attorney suggested obtaining an order of protection due to the woman's unstable behavior. During our encounter, she claimed that I had undergone a sex change to avoid child support, referring to me as he. She also asserted that I make more than enough money and that my income belongs to her and our child. However, we ultimately decided against pursuing a restraining order after she provided an honest explanation of how this situation arose. It turns out that she, myself, and my male cousin used to work together over a decade ago in the same organization. I worked a different shift in a different area of the building while she worked as a secretary and my cousin held a typical office job. 
Despite not having any direct interactions with them at work, I didn't even know she worked there, she had access to my information through the company's prior employee records. She became aware of my familial connection to my cousin, as he had mentioned that I was his cousin and also worked at the same place. To confirm this connection, she checked his Facebook profile where he had our family listed. Through this link, she discovered my cousin's father, who happens to be my uncle. My mother, who is listed as my cousin's sister-in-law, his CIL, was always my emergency contact, and therefore had access to my information as well. Based on this information, she believed that she could file a lawsuit against me, obtain a DNA test to establish paternity, and then use that connection to go after my uncle for child support. Her reasoning was that since my cousin is currently incarcerated and my uncle has a stable retirement income, he would be a more viable target. To be honest, I don't fully understand her thought process as I am not familiar with the legal intricacies involved or whether her plan was even feasible. Additionally, she mentioned that she was recently fired, which prompted her to pursue this course of action. She knew of my cousin's incarceration and saw an opportunity to seek financial assistance by locating me through our shared last name and making copies of my resume and important information from my file. After all the drama and chaos, she eventually decided to give up the fight when she realized she couldn't win, especially after I presented documents that included my original adoption and birth records. This revelation made it clear that a DNA test would not support her claims. I apologize if this update isn't as exciting as you were hoping for. However, I am relieved that this ordeal is over. Ultimately, I hope she seeks the help she needs, but I will keep my distance and warn my family about her. I get that she is desperate, but she should have texted your cousin's dad and told him about the situation, and then went from there. It's unbelievable how far some people are willing to go for their own- As I innocently sipped my soda in the park near the school, little did I know that a simple misunderstanding would escalate into a neighborhood spectacle. It all started when Karen says I'm drinking vodka in a school zone, but it's just soda. Here's how it all went down. I never thought a simple trip to the park near an elementary school would turn into a neighborhood spectacle, but when Karen gets involved, expect the unexpected. It was a sunny Tuesday afternoon, and I decided to take a break from my home office. I grabbed a bottle of Sprite, poured it into a clear glass bottle to avoid carrying the whole two liter, and headed out. The park was buzzing with kids and parents, enjoying the rare warmth of an early spring day. As I sat on a bench, sipping my soda, I noticed Karen from the corner of my eye. She's the kind of person who thrives on community drama, always poking her nose where it doesn't belong. Today, it seemed, I was on her radar. Excuse me, Karen's voice sliced through the air, her finger pointed accusingly at me. Are you seriously drinking vodka in a school zone? I looked around confused. It's just Sprite, I said, holding up the bottle. Karen marched over, her eyes narrowed. That's what they all say. Drinking alcohol in public, especially near a school, is irresponsible and illegal. I tried to reason with her. Karen, it's literally just soda. Smell it if you don't believe me. But Karen was on a roll. I'm calling the police. You're setting a terrible example for these kids. As she dialed, a small crowd began to gather. Parents whispered, kids stared, and I felt my face flush with embarrassment. This was ridiculous. The police arrived within minutes, two officers approaching with a mix of confusion and annoyance. We got a call about public intoxication? One of them asked. Karen pounced. Yes, this person is drinking vodka right here in the park. The officer turned to me. Is that true? I handed him the bottle. It's Sprite. You can check. He sniffed the bottle, then took a small sip. It's soda, he confirmed, handing it back to me. Karen's face turned a shade of red I didn't know was possible. But, but, it's in a clear glass bottle. Who does that? The officer sighed. Ma'am, there's no law against drinking soda in a park. Please don't waste our time with false reports. As the officers left, the crowd dispersed. But Karen stood there, fuming. You think you're clever, don't you? She hissed. I shrugged. I just wanted to enjoy the weather, Karen. That's all. For the next hour, I tried to ignore her glares from across the park, but as I got up to leave, Karen approached me again. I'm watching you, she warned. One slip up, and I'll be there. I nodded, feeling a mix of amusement and annoyance. Noted, Karen. Have a great day. As I walked home, I couldn't help but laugh at the absurdity of it all. Karen, the self-appointed guardian of the neighborhood, had made a fool of herself over a bottle of Sprite, but in a strange way, I felt a bit sorry for her. Her life must be so empty if this was what she chose to focus on. That evening, I shared the story with my friends online, and it quickly went viral. Comments poured in, some laughing at the situation, others sharing their own Karen encounters. It was a small, silly incident, but it brought a lot of people together in laughter and camaraderie. A few days later, I returned to the park, this time with a can of Sprite, just to avoid any confusion. Karen was there, watching me like a hawk. I raised my can in a mock toast and winked. She scowled and turned away. 
From then on, Karen and I had an unspoken truce. She no longer confronted me, and I made sure to keep my beverages clearly labeled. It wasn't a perfect solution, but it was a peaceful coexistence. And every time I saw a clear glass bottle, I couldn't help but smile at the memory of the day Karen thought I was drinking vodka in a school zone. It was a reminder of how quickly things can escalate over a simple misunderstanding, and how sometimes, a little humor is all you need to diffuse a tense situation. Haha, -ha, this story had me cracking up. Poor Karen, getting all worked up over a bottle of Sprite. I can't believe she called the police. Glad everything worked out in the end, though. Cheers to the peaceful coexistence and the power of humor. I never thought I'd become entangled in a web of family drama, but when my sister's failing marriage took a dark turn, I found myself caught in the middle. Little did I know that a single repulsive comment would shatter the fragile balance and force my sister to make a life-altering decision. Here's how it all went down. My husband and I have been married for two years. We have an unusual sleeping arrangement. I'm a very light sleeper and I've struggled with insomnia most of my life. It takes me a long time to fall asleep. Sometimes even the slightest noise wakes me up and I have to start all over again. My husband, on the other hand, becomes some sort of taekwondo prodigy in his sleep with how much he kicks. He has been like this since he was a kid, and any attempts to stop it have been a failure. He sleeps like a rock, so he doesn't even realize what he's doing. He also talks in his sleep occasionally. I have a job that I need to wake up super early for, so my sleep is important to me. When we first moved in together, we slept in the same bed. But of course, that didn't work out. I was left exhausted. He just felt super guilty, even when he wasn't consciously doing it. Eventually, we decided to have our sleeping areas in separate rooms. We aren't angry with each other at all. We understand that some people just have different sleeping habits. This has not affected our sex life at all. We still lie together in one of the beds to watch movies or something all the time. Sometimes we even fall asleep in the same bed, which I feel fine with as long as I don't have work in the morning. It's a little unorthodox, but it's what works for us. My older sister Layla and her husband are going through a rough patch in their marriage. I think her husband is a huge jerk. He cheated on her and made some excuse that he did it just because she was ignoring him and refused to fulfill his needs. She's so busy because they have three kids that he doesn't help her with at all. I was shocked when she told me she was staying with him even after the affair was exposed. I tried to talk her out of it, but she told me to mind my own business, so I did. They're in marriage counseling now. From what Layla has relayed to me, it's not going well. She's been trying to change to fix their relationship. He doesn't even try to become a better husband. He just gives some half-assed apology and justifies his actions. I hate him, but I guess it's her choice as a grown woman to stay. She's of course devastated, but also reacting strangely to the whole thing. She's convinced herself it's all her fault. If she had just paid more attention to him, then none of this wouldn't have happened. I've tried to tell her that isn't true, but she doesn't listen. The other day, she came to our apartment to chat and so I could see my nieces. My husband was at work. She's actually never been to my apartment before. Her and her husband have a large, fancy house, so I usually just go to them. With how tense things are now, she said she'd prefer to come to my apartment. One of my nieces opened what she thought was the bathroom door. It was actually the door to my husband's separate bedroom. Layla saw inside that it was lived in, so she asked if we had gotten a roommate. I said no, and just gave her a quick rundown on the situation. She seemed a bit weirded out, but didn't say anything until my nieces were all in the living room watching a movie. She began to ask all these weird questions about our sex life, love for one another, etc. I said we were doing just fine, and some of the personal questions she asked were none of her business. She got a bit snappy then and said that she's just trying to help me. If I left my husband out of my bedroom and didn't attend to his needs, he may just run off with some other woman. She told me to be careful and that it would be better to just sleep in one bed despite any sleep issues. She even said, you have to keep an eye on him constantly so he won't feel the need to leave you for someone more attentive. I got frustrated. It wasn't even about the bedrooms anymore. She was just projecting her situation onto me. I was also upset she would suggest my husband would cheat on me for not being attentive enough. I snapped and sharply said that her husband is the cheating jerk, not mine. Just because her marriage is failing doesn't mean she gets to critique and coach mine. That made her super angry, and she immediately stood up and stormed to the living room to get her daughters and go home. She won't answer my calls. She just sent me one text that said she was just trying to help, and to not be surprised when my husband cheats. My husband was offended as well, but said he understood she's going through a very tough time now. He suggested I was just a bit too harsh and should have just let her get her paranoia rant out of her system and move on. Her mental state isn't all that good, and she's probably just not thinking clearly. My mom agrees with him. She said Layla was being weird and insensitive, but I shouldn't have said something so personal. That yelling at her will only push her further away from us and towards her jerk husband. I actually feel kind of bad now. She's obviously not thinking clearly and I should have just moved on. 
Am I the jerk? Something very intense happened with my sister last night. I was getting anxious and was planning to just go to her house to apologize and try to move on from this. But before I could go, my mom called and asked me to come over. I was shocked to arrive and see my sister sobbing with her suitcase and daughters. She was very distraught and still crying so we had a bit of a hard time understanding her. Eventually we figured out what happened. Apparently earlier that day when she was home her husband said something so repulsive she just left. Before that she was serving him a drink and walked away to clean the kitchen and do some laundry. Her oldest daughter walked in and plopped onto the couch beside her father to watch a movie. He laughed and made some offensive joke about how she should enjoy lazing around now. Because when she gets a husband, all that's gonna end. My niece asked why. He pointed to my sister and said, Look at your mom, for example. Great right now, but we almost divorced when she neglected her wifely duties. You should just be like her now all the time and skip the drama. That broke my sister. She packed up and left within the hour. He didn't chase and just said she'll be home soon. She's still frazzled and doesn't talk much, but I'm happy she's away from her jerk husband. It's understandable that emotions were running high and it seems like she's been through a lot with her husband. It's important to be there for her during this difficult time. Family support can make a big difference in helping her heal from the emotional abuse she has experienced. Take some time to reach out to her, apologize, and offer your support. It's important to show empathy and understanding as she may still be processing her emotions. Remember, it's not about assigning blame, but rather about being there for each other as family. Let's hope that in the future, both of you can look back on this as a distant memory and laugh about how silly and dramatic it all seemed. Family can be complicated, but at the end of the day, love and support will always prevail. As the host of the Christmas party, I refused to baby-proof my house and lock my cats outside, causing tension among my co-workers. One co-worker, a single mom, insisted on bringing her children and demanded special accommodations. When she decided to hold the party at her own house, tensions escalated even further. Here's how it all went down. So Christmas is coming and my workplace is brimming with lights and ideas of who should hold the Christmas party this year. Since it is a small company, one small house would be enough. I happened to have a pool in my backyard and just invested in a BBQ. They all asked me if I could hold the party this year, and I said yes with two conditions. First, this will be an adult-only party. And second, we will have a BBQ with prawns and other normal BBQ food. Everyone agreed, and some just asked if I could cook the prawns separately since they are allergic. No problem. I am more than happy to assist with that to make sure no one would have any health issues. One coworker just came back from maternity leave last week after six months, and she was very adamant about coming to the party. She sent an email to all of us asking if she could bring her three children with her to the party. One person replied with the old email stating my conditions to host. She was not happy to say the least. In the last few days, she has been talking to others, including the boss, and persuading them to talk to me, and they did. My boss asked me to be flexible because she just came back, and we should not exclude her like that. She was there while we talked and asked me to baby-proof the house. She mentioned that her oldest child is suffering from some type of illness that makes him unable to sit still, and she is also allergic to cats, so she asked me to clean the whole house off cat hair and lock them outside until the party is done. According to her, if each of us pays some attention to the children, there would be no problem, and the youngest will stay by her side. I straight up said no, I would not baby-proof the house, and I would never lock my cats outside for any reason. I told her and the boss that she should not join the party since there would be alcohol, hot BBQ, and the pool would be dangerous to children without supervision. I made it clear that I agreed to hold the party because everyone agreed with my terms. If anyone is unhappy with that, they are more than welcome to hold the party at their place. I will not complain. She stormed out of the boss's office with tears in her eyes. Some people told me to keep the office peaceful by just going along with her demand only for a few hours. I refused. I really don't care if anyone decided to not show up that day. If there are fewer people, then more alcohol for me. No biggie. Now my boss decided to reevaluate the situation and sent an email asking if anyone else volunteered to hold the party. I was not included in that email I found out through a work friend. I did not say anything and ignored it. People have been replying by email to each other without me and no solution. Yesterday she came in with her baby and tried to show me, I don't like any type of kid so I asked her to leave my table and continue to work. She took offense and left for the whole day. Her workload fell back on us since we all thought she would come back but as of right now, she comes and goes as she pleases because there would always be something with the babies. People are telling me to stop being a jerk and just give her what she wants because being a mother of three is no small job and she deserves a break too. To be honest, I almost laugh out loud hearing that. Still, people insisted that I was the jerk in this situation. So am I the jerk? Today we received this message from her. Here it is. Good Sunday to you. 
I think I should email you guys after church today to let you know about the current situation that we are all in. As you know, I have been asking to join the Christmas party, but some of you think it was a joke. I do want to come. I have been on leave for so long. Is it too much to ask for some free time to catch up with you guys? It is not very Christian of you to not help out a single mom. To avoid any further confusion, I will hold the company Christmas party at my house. It is not big and does not have a pool, but it will be a great honor to have you all at my place for the party. You all know that I am the mom of three beautiful angels. I am not in a position to spend a lot of funds on a party. I am asking all of you to find love in your hearts to help us with cleaning up our house before and after the party. Also, please bring your own dish to the party. We will all enjoy the variety of food from your country. We do have strict food guidelines to make sure my angels don't have a bad experience. So please no seafood, no junk food. We all want something that stems from loving hearts. And before you say anything, I do know someone is already up for host, but I do think it is very selfish of you to make it so hard for a single mom like me to attend. You don't know how hard it is to be a single mom at all. Before I last went into labor, I asked Lori to have a short praying time where you would pray to God for Sonny's health, and I knew some did not do that. I did not ask for much, just 10 short minutes, but some of you refused. I am so disappointed by the lack of hospitality we single moms should receive. You know my children will grow up and take care of all of you in the future. They will work, and their tax money will come back to take care of you in the future. The younger generation is lacking a moral compass to have children, and that responsibility falls on us moms. May God shine his love. Well, that was quite the Christmas party drama. It's clear that tensions ran high and opinions clashed. Remember, it's important to try and find common ground and show empathy, even in challenging situations. I never expected my life to take such a dramatic turn when Rose, my ex-girlfriend, revealed that she had cheated on me and that the baby she was carrying wasn't mine. Devastated, I ended the relationship. But now, years later, a chance encounter at a funeral has made me question everything. The child, Daisy, bears an uncanny resemblance to me and I'm left wondering if Rose's deceit runs deeper than I ever imagined. Here's how it all went down. Rose and I were together for four years, from our last year at school until just after university. I loved her very much and genuinely thought I would marry her. However, we were very much not in a place to have a child. We had previously discussed the matter and agreed that we were both okay with termination if it came to it. Six years ago, she became pregnant. She broke down when she told me four months in and admitted that she had cheated on me and that the baby wasn't mine. I immediately ended the relationship and she moved home to have the baby. It crushed me as this was totally out of the blue and utterly unlike her and she refused to provide many details and the whole situation just seemed vague and off. Recently, Rose's father passed away and my mother attended the funeral. While there, she commiserated with Rose, who was there with her husband and daughter, who, according to my mother, is visibly biracial and has a striking resemblance to me. How do I even begin to bring this up with her? I feel like I have to but have no idea where to even start. I don't want to be a dad, but I also don't want to just abandon some kid that might be mine. I also feel like I've moved on enough to be ready for closure and to actually address the whole matter with Rose. The breakup happened in such a rush and she moved away before I felt able to address the topic in any kind of a rational, logical way. The options are that she cheated on me and became pregnant with someone else's child. She cheated on me and has lied to me about her pregnancy, or she just made up the whole scenario for some unpleasant reason. Help? Rose got in touch with me. She asked my mother for my phone number and texted me to ask whether I would be free to have a call with her this week. I passed on commiserations for her father and told her to call me anytime this week outside of work hours. So the child is 100% mine. I'll refer to her as Daisy in this story. I've met Daisy a few times and she's a really cute and lovely little kid. I'm enjoying getting to know her, although I am sad that I missed out on her development and many firsts. I'm also sad that I haven't had the opportunity to influence her as a father would hope. For example, she understands some Polish because of her stepfather's family. While I grew up in a household where elders spoke Creole, I wish she could have explored her heritage from birth, but now she can choose whether she wants to do so, which is also exciting. She also strongly resembles me as a child, which is strange but nice. My mother says she is the spitting image of her aunt, so we have been showing Daisy some family photos, which she seems to enjoy. My ex, Rose, is doing a great job of raising Daisy. I want to emphasize that. Rose behaved poorly in our relationship, but she is a wonderful mother. Over time, I'll be getting to know Daisy better, with the intention of eventually having her spend summer or winter vacations with me, if she wishes, when she is a bit older. Rose and her husband are also planning to bring Daisy to meet my mom when they are in our hometown, so Daisy can get to know her biological grandmother if she wants. Rose is married to a very decent guy who clearly adores Daisy. To answer a question I received in several direct messages, Rose's husband is white, Rose is white, and I am black. 
so it was fairly obvious that Daisy was not his biological child. However, he is very obviously her father. We are getting along well, and he is supportive of me getting to know Daisy. Now, on to the difficult part. Rose has apologized repeatedly for her actions. She says she did not cheat on me, and I have come to believe her. However, the lie still hurts. She has explained that this is something that has weighed heavily on her, and she knew she would have to address it eventually. I haven't forgiven her, but we are moving past it as best we can. We are both in therapy, and considering doing therapy together to ensure we are healthy co-parents for Daisy. I have called her out and will continue to do so. This has not been one conversation but a series of talks to understand each other's positions. Her explanation was that she knew if I knew she was pregnant and wanted to keep the baby, I would have given up on the life I wanted to have in order to support her. Instead, she broke up with me and moved back home where her father supported her until she had Daisy. Despite the sadness of this situation, I am currently in a good place in life and relatively successful. Perhaps she is right that I would not have managed this if we had a baby at our young age, but I still wish she had given me the choice to say yes or no. However, what's done is done. There are some details that I prefer not to mention, even on an anonymous forum like Reddit, which provide further context and understanding for Rose's actions. I apologize for the anti-climax, for leaving that out, but it wouldn't feel right to share. Currently, Rose and her husband are declining to accept child support from me, stating that they earn enough to raise Daisy without it. They have not made access to Daisy contingent on money or anything else. I'm going to consult with a lawyer to determine whether they will be able to pursue child support from me in the future, and to explore the legalities of placing such money into a trust for Daisy's use as an adult, or perhaps for college. I believe that covers everything. It may not be as dramatic as some people were hoping for, so I apologize for that. But I think everyone involved in the situation is doing their best. Life can really throw some unexpected curveballs, huh? It's amazing how one chance encounter can make you question everything. But hey, it seems like everyone involved is trying their best to navigate this complicated situation. Here's to hoping for a positive resolution and lots of love for little Daisy. As I secretly plotted my escape from a toxic relationship, a shocking twist unfolded. My sister-in-law's upcoming wedding was planned to take place at my house, unbeknownst to her. Fueled by resentment and a desire for freedom, I made a daring decision that would change everything. Here's how it all went down. I put a lot of effort into building my relationship with Ryan. I made accommodations in my schedule, did things to make him feel loved and appreciated, and tried my best to be a doting girlfriend. However, I'm ashamed to admit that despite everything I've done, I can't stand him. It's not that I hate him, but I find him repulsive. I've come to realize that he is extremely immature, and not in a fun-loving way. Whenever I point this out, he dismisses it by saying he's like Peter Pan. In the past, this caused me emotional distress, but I've moved beyond that now. He is a very controlling person, who still sees being a mommy's little boy as some kind of accomplishment. He often talks about his childhood in great detail, and acts as if he can still get away with anything. Ryan even describes his past sexual encounters with his exes, which makes me feel terrible. I don't feel appreciated in this relationship. He shushes me whenever I bring up my heritage, claiming that it only keeps me tied to the past. He also criticized my love for my childhood home, and became very triggered when I mentioned some male friends from high school who are dear to me. I have built a successful career while he spends all his time playing games. I'm frustrated. Over the past three years, I have worked hard to complete my MBA, establish and grow my small business, and secure major companies as clients. Meanwhile, Ryan continues to rely on favors to find jobs, only to get fired repeatedly. I have asked him to stop relying on handouts and start making purchases for things he wants instead. Last summer, he dragged me to a kiosk at the farmer's market because the vendor offered him a free sandwich. What is bothering me the most is that he can't give me a clear answer after I became suspicious that he lied about his degree. This is a serious issue because it means he lied about his prospects and allowed me to include him in my life while expecting me to take responsibility for him. I believed he had found a job, only to discover that he was attending board game tournaments at a local indie gaming shop. My feelings for him have changed since last New Year's Eve when he stood me up to visit his family without inviting me along. We had already made plans for a quiet and romantic evening, and I had prepared the food and wine. He waited until 2 p.m. to inform me that I would be spending the evening alone. He claimed that his mother needed him because New Year's Eve reminded her of his father, who left her in the 90s and married his mistress in the 2000s. I felt devastated. He knew how important New Year's Eve is to me and that I had been eagerly anticipating a romantic evening, especially considering my family lives on the other side of the country. He is aware that being here is a sacrifice for me, as I have children whom I go to great lengths to spend time with, including flying to see them every Wednesday. I took a client whose deadline was January 2nd, their culture doesn't celebrate New Year's Eve, and I agreed because I needed the money. 
That was a game changer for me, but my heart was broken. After that, I've tried to work around not losing my love for him, but what I feel is that I'm experiencing the pain of losing respect for this man. I can't stand it, I can't even look at him, and I feel very guilty because I'm finding my happiness behind his back. I feel like I'm doing something wrong. I constantly make up supposed work schedules just to get away from him. I can't take this anymore. His sister asked me to allow her to have her wedding at my place because she can't afford anything else, and now she's not speaking to me, but she still expects me to host her. I agreed to have the wedding where I live, because I thought we could actually get to know each other and it would help to create a good relationship which is important to me. I don't know if she's not speaking to me because she feels she doesn't need me anymore or because there's something I don't know that's happening. I'm mentioning this because my sister-in-law and mother-in-law have a history of playing the victim, and my sister-in-law finds ways to get aggravated constantly. I tried to talk to her, and she has simply ignored my calls and my messages. I thought that because of this, she had decided to have her wedding elsewhere. But now I'm being informed that I need to remove my pets from my furniture so that she can use my living room for her ceremony. I texted and called to get clarification and was left on read and honestly, I got upset. It feels like I'm begging to be a part of their family. I'm extremely angry and I expressed my anger to him but he just shrugged it off. I've made the decision to move out without informing him. I've already spoken to my landlord to terminate my lease two months early. While he's at work, I'll gather my pets and belongings and simply drive away. I'm tired of feeling lonely in this relationship. Last month I was recognized by a career guild and I chose not to invite him as my plus one because I didn't want him in any pictures with me. It would have spoiled the moment. I don't owe him anything. When I had COVID, he left me alone and became irritated whenever I asked for help with buying food. Furthermore, he has never appreciated or celebrated me, even though I went out of my way to help his mom despite her attitude. I ended up spending my birthday alone because he was too busy. All he does is ask me how much more money I'm going to get in the future. I know this is my fault because at some point I promised him that I would help him fund his dream restaurant. But that was back when things were great between us. I know it's wrong to go back on my word, but I can't help it. I don't want to be in his future, and I don't want to invest in his life. I'm still down for what I'm doing. I don't know if I'm being a jerk for planning on leaving him without telling him. I just don't want his family to yell at me like they did to my other sister-in-law when she left my brother-in-law. Also, my sister-in-law can be very volatile and both she and my mother-in-law claim they have assaulted people, but I don't know if they are just bragging. He has been asking what's going on because I can barely hide my contempt whenever he tries to initiate a conversation about helping him create a business. I'm fed up with having to listen to his insistent questions that are making me feel very uncomfortable. I told him I'm not an insistent person. I didn't harass him to come to my place when he stood me up on New Year's Eve. I didn't insist that he give me a present for my birthday because he's an adult. He says it's different since a business is a lifelong situation and a birthday gift loses value. I'm clear on the end of our relationship, but I'm kind of doubtful about ruining the wedding. It's 10 days away. Am I the jerk? I've been kind of inactive due to having to deal with things so that I could move out, settle into my new place and have lots of work from my daily career stuff. Letting them have the wedding at my place after I was gone was not an option because, as some pointed out, they could damage the place. Also, there's a lot going on right now. I talked to my ex-boss and was as honest as possible. She was alarmed. Her reaction was 400% more upset than the average Redditor feeling empathy for my situation. She stepped in because I couldn't find emergency movers. There's a cargo division at her company, and while she couldn't send any employees to move my stuff during working hours, she helped me find some employees who do moving gigs off-duty. I talked to my family and explained what's happening. I flew my pets to them. I'll be completely moving back home in a few weeks so that I could have some elbow space because I didn't know if I could find a new place as soon as possible that was also pet friendly. The movers were very organized and thankfully took everything out as quickly as permitted. I followed advice to change the locks. I also paid the landlord a cleaning fee because the advice I got on here was very eye-opening and I didn't want to linger alone. The landlord inspected, not much to inspect except for any damages which were none and agreed to let me out of the lease. My lawyer gave me plenty of advice, which comes down to him having a different address as his official dwelling place to get his mail, child support paperwork, and where he lists himself in official documents. As long as I kept detailed information of returning his property intact and not retaining his property, there wasn't much that he could claim. I put all his stuff in trash bags and left it on his mother's porch. It made sense not to spend a dime on shipping anything. I recorded everything and took inventory. Nothing was damaged or broken, and my lawyer has records. My best friend is gold. She dropped everything and had her foot up my jerk telling me off for allowing him to get this far in terms of treating me badly. She also arranged for me to stay with her boyfriend's mom for a few days until the new place that I applied to sent me notice. All I needed was a room with a bathroom or something. 
I couldn't deal with putting all my furniture up again as I'm leaving the area soon. I'm paying rent at her mother-in-law's house, although it's three hours away from my office and it's not feasible for the long term. So I'm going to my office two times a week and doing the rest via video call. Whatever I do, I won't be going back to town. My former boss says she is concerned and helped me get a small office space, meeting room, for obligatory face meetings that I can do within a one-hour distance ratio. I'm extremely grateful because I know she's not obligated. She was always a boss when she was my supervisor way back when. But with what she's done for me, I would call her Khaleesi and feel like it's real. D-Day. My mother-in-law was outside when I went to leave his stuff. Honestly, I hesitated. But I realized there would never be a perfect time to drop everything off. So I quickly got out of my car, left everything, and ignored her persistent questions. I avoided making eye contact, and it was very uncomfortable. He called me and accused me of being petty and unjustified. He said he would come to my place so we could talk. I didn't clarify anything. If he was gaslighting me, then he deserved to drive all the way here only to find that he couldn't get in. He called me again at night, saying his key wasn't working. I told him he was absolutely right, and I informed him that I no longer live there. I don't need to describe the chaotic situation because I'm pretty sure it's universal to abusive partners. First, he was angry, then he demanded that I show up, and then he tried to blame me for his family's well-being. I mentioned that his sister-in-law never replied to my messages, and she can have her wedding elsewhere. I kept my cool as my best friend Rina suggested, just to spite him. He was livid and went from confused to angry, to lying about me using him. I did talk to sister-in-law and had a surprisingly civilized conversation that amounted to nothing because two hours later, she and Ryan's cousins started spamming my phone. By that day during the afternoon, I was pissed enough when she had her groom call me. I'll call him George. George and I have never had a real relationship. We never really talked during family events, and we didn't even have each other on social media. He's a mellow guy, kind of a Pink Panther personality, slow walking, won't mess with anyone, very quiet. I was somewhat surprised by his attitude, but not completely caught off guard. I understand that he had been given misleading information about the venue, which led him to believe that I left out of jealousy or spite towards Ryan and his family. It also bothered me when he started spreading baseless rumors about me. I know he was innocently passing on gossip, thinking it was true, but it still made me angry. I'm not proud of this, but I told him that Ryan and his family don't respect him and say embarrassing things behind his back. However, I made it clear that it doesn't give me the right to repeat demeaning comments or turn him into an enemy. I mentioned that unfortunately, Ryan always refers to him as the spare guy, because Sayel had a thing for her ex-husband, and he was the only one willing to marry her out of the few guys she dated. He demanded proof, so I provided voicemails that Ryan had sent me. In those voicemails, Ryan would often belittle other guys, saying things like, I'm not like George, George is only good at keeping quiet and taking orders, and George's mom looks horny. Ryan even mentioned that George struggled with his performance in bed and needed a pill. Ryan also mentioned that George was acting out, but his sister threatened to leave him, and he got scared. Again, I'm not happy about what I did, but I felt insulted that someone who never even talked to me had the audacity to confront me. To be honest, it didn't deter him. I had him on speaker while I was in a parking lot having lunch with Rina. Rina got angry with George for persisting, but we finally understood what was going on when he accused me of taking their money. Apparently, he had given Essiel a deposit because he believed that I demanded to be paid for using my place, but that never happened. It didn't make sense. They asked for my help because they were broke, and I never asked for money. Rina made herself known on the call, and when George asked who she was, she simply replied, Don't worry about it. She told him that he was out of line, but since he was being stubborn and we both believed he wasn't to blame, she suggested we have a call. George sounded confident that he was in the right, and a minute later I received an invitation to a chat group. The second crap show was terrible, but necessary. I know I stooped a bit low, but I'm satisfied that I followed Reddit's advice about burning the bridge and poisoning the water. I added, father-in-law to the chat, and I'm sure Ryan will never forgive me for it. Just to give you some background, Ryan has always had a complex about father-in-law seeing him as a Goliath figure. He has a deep-rooted competitiveness with his father and constantly wants to outdo him, often forgetting that father-in-law is an old man. I'm not sure if I'm right, but sometimes it feels like they're fighting against an idea rather than reality. The call started out messy, with insults and lots of yelling, but at that point, I was sick of their behavior. I provided evidence that I had tried to reach out to them without getting any response. I forwarded all the voicemails and screenshots, especially the ones where Ryan expressed excitement about his sister having a venue, and thanked me for understanding that she couldn't pay for it. Mother-in-law dropped out of the call as soon as father-in-law joined. 
I explained to father-in-law what was going on, thanked him for always treating me with respect, and clarified that I offered my place as a venue but was ignored when it came to discussing the matter. I also expressed my opinion that Ryan is not suitable to be with a hardworking and successful partner because he's a parasite. I mentioned that I can't respect a man who doesn't have a real job, spends his days playing games, and is probably lying about his new job. All Ryan said was, wow, and that I was insulting him, and it gets worse. Father-in-law is constantly demonized for leaving mother-in-law, and he started talking sternly about feeling confused and disappointed with all the wedding-related drama. He and Ryan got into an argument, and CL started yelling. Despite my dislike for Ryan due to everything he's done, it felt heavy hearing father-in-law call him a moron and a source of embarrassment. Father-in-law mentioned that he's fed up with all his children and despite knowing that they resent him, he gave sister-in-law $2,000 as a gift to pay off debt or use for the wedding. However, she spent it all on outings and good times instead, which infuriated him every time he saw her posts on Facebook. I don't have much information about this, but I know that George was really taken aback by it and kept asking about it. He sounded confused like someone who had been denied resources that were readily available, but I could be wrong. Father-in-law said he expected his money back because he was tired of all the drama and told them not to come to him when they get a divorce if this continues. Father-in-law told sister-in-law to stop listening to Ryan because he's beyond help and can't be of assistance to anyone due to being both dumb and greedy. He compared Ryan to an open mouth with an eternally empty stomach. Father-in-law also called SEL ridiculous for blindly following Ryan, likening her to a cult member. Sill started yelling at him, and he told her that's exactly why all her men run away from her and that she should ask her mother if temper tantrums and victim mentality are in any way attractive. It opened up a huge can of worms, and I immediately left the call because I was very stressed out, despite trying to remain level-headed. I blocked everyone, changed my number, secured all my social media, and removed apps where I didn't know how to block people. It's been weeks, and there haven't been any updates about the wedding. None of my friends who have checked their profiles have seen anything other than cryptic posts written by George. I can't guarantee that the wedding didn't take place, but it doesn't seem likely. I also agree with the comments suggesting to have a court wedding. They could have done that. To provide further clarification, I wanted father-in-law to know everything because he was often the only friendly face in that family, and I didn't want to leave without him understanding the truth. He has been decent to me, and I didn't want him to think that I'm some kind of witch who ruined his daughter's wedding for fun. Thank you again. My kids are under 10 years old. Years ago, I struggled to provide for them. Their father preferred spending money on lawyers rather than paying proper child support. It's a long and painful story for me. I had two jobs and found a side gig that was commission-based. I didn't fully understand it at first, but received some training and eventually got the hang of it. Having a few extra hundred dollars at the end of the month made me feel better, as I could cover some bills and not stress out during the holidays. To make a long story short, I eventually got hired with a salary and benefits. I developed a drive for learning and ensuring that I could provide for my kids. I moved on to a new job, which I remember fondly. That's where I met my former boss, who helped me move out this time. That job opened many doors for me. I was able to secure a better position, a good salary, and help my parents, among other things. However, the company decided to shut down operations in my area. I applied for local jobs but received a very good offer for a job transfer. They wanted me to be in charge of several employees and offered a salary increase to open a new department and replicate operations. My ex-boss and two other employees took the leap with me. My ex-boss now works at a different company. I discussed the situation with my kids and my parents. My kids weren't thrilled, and my parents weren't in love with the idea either. Taking the kids with me would have been devastating, as they are very close to my parents. So I sat down and did the math. The cost of living in my new location was much higher. If I went alone, I could manage and save money to start a business and create a fund for my kids. I currently live in a nice but relatively affordable place and prioritize using my money for my kids. When I moved here, I negotiated partial remote work. That's why I mentioned in my original post that I travel every Wednesday after work and stay until Sunday, no matter what. After my work agreement ended, I had already signed agreements with local companies as clients. Some of my work can be easily managed remotely, but a lot of it requires me to be on site. I didn't have the financial strength to hire multiple executives until I got the client for New Year's Eve, mentioned in a previous post. Currently, I'm working with a local consulting client until December. That's why my former boss helped me find a place to hold meetings. As I didn't feel comfortable going to my old office, I was subletting from a colleague, for obvious reasons. My ex leaving me hanging on New Year's Eve was the beginning of the end. I stayed to focus on the work I had to do and couldn't risk losing hours on traveling and not being able to deliver. That holiday is very important to me and my family. I was stressed because I had a tight deadline, and instead of being supportive, he made it worse. There were many complex dynamics and challenges involved. 
It serves as a reminder that relationships and family dynamics can be messy and difficult to navigate. It's important to prioritize self-care, set boundaries, and make decisions that align with one's own well-being and happiness. As the sun bathed the local park in its warm glow, little did I know that a chance encounter with a police officer named Karen would ignite a chain of events that would test my patience and challenge my rights. With each escalating demand and refusal to acknowledge my deafness, the tension between us grew as she thought that I was ignoring her orders. But little did Karen know I was about to be vindicated in the most unexpected way. Here's how it all went down. The sun hung high in the sky, casting a warm golden hue over the local park. It was one of those rare days where everything seemed to be in perfect harmony. Children laughed as they played on the swings. Couples sat on benches sharing quiet moments, and the elderly fed the birds, reminiscing about days gone by. The park was a sanctuary for many, a place to escape the hustle and bustle of city life. For me, John, the park was more than just an escape. It was a place of solace. Being deaf since birth, I had always experienced the world differently. While others heard the melodies of birds or the whispers of the wind, I felt them. The vibrations of footsteps, the rhythmic beating of a distant drum, and the silent laughter of children playing were my symphony. The world was alive in a way that many couldn't understand, and the park was my favorite place to immerse myself in its silent beauty. I had made it a ritual to visit the park every weekend, taking the same path, sitting on the same bench and watching the world go by. Over the years, I had become a familiar face to many regulars. There was Mrs. Thompson, who always had a bag of breadcrumbs for the ducks, and little Timmy, who would show me his latest toy car. They all knew of my deafness and communicated with me through gestures, smiles, and the occasional note. But that fateful afternoon, as I was engrossed in my thoughts, admiring a particularly vibrant flower, I was unaware that a new face had entered the park, a face that would soon disrupt the tranquility of my sanctuary. Officer Karen, as I would later come to know her, was a stern-looking middle-aged woman with a no-nonsense demeanor. She was known for her strict adherence to the rules and her low tolerance for any perceived disrespect. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed Karen in a police uniform approaching me with a stern look on her face. Hey, stop right there, she shouted, though I couldn't hear her. She waved her arms frantically, trying to get my attention. I stopped and turned, my face a mask of confusion. I'm sorry, I'm deaf, I signed, hoping she'd understand. I then pointed to my ears and shook my head, trying to convey my inability to hear. But instead of understanding, her face contorted in anger. You think you can just ignore me because I'm a woman? She snapped, her voice rising with every word. I could see her lips moving rapidly, her gestures aggressive. I can't hear you, I signed again, more emphatically this time. I took out a small notepad from my pocket and scribbled down, I'm deaf, please write down what you want to say. She snatched the notepad from my hands, her eyes scanning the message. Deaf or not, you should respect the law, she wrote back, shoving the notepad into my chest. I was taken aback. What did I do wrong, I wrote, genuinely puzzled. You ignored my orders, she scribbled furiously. I didn't hear them, I wrote back, trying to keep my composure. Our written exchange continued, with each message becoming more heated than the last. Why are you ignoring me? Karen scribbled furiously on the notepad. I'm not. I can't hear you, I wrote back, my hand shaking slightly. You should have made it clear from the start, she retorted, her pen pressing hard onto the paper. I tried to tell you multiple times, I replied, frustration evident in my handwriting. She glared at me, her face red with anger. You're just making excuses, she snapped verbally, even though she knew I couldn't hear her. I took a deep breath, trying to remain calm. I'm not making excuses. I'm deaf, I wrote, emphasizing the last word. But before I could react, Karen had already pulled out her handcuffs. You're under arrest for disobeying a police officer, she said aloud, her voice dripping with disdain. I felt a cold metal grip around my wrists and a sinking feeling in my stomach. This was not how I had imagined my day would go. I felt a surge of panic. My heart raced and I tried to reason with her one last time, pointing to my ears and shaking my head. I'm deaf, I mouthed slowly, hoping she'd finally understand. Just as Karen was about to lead me away, a voice rang out. Hey, what are you doing? He's deaf. He can't hear you. I turned to see a young woman, probably in her mid-twenties, with a determined look on her face, standing up for me. She had been sitting on a nearby bench, watching the entire scene unfold. Karen, taken aback by the sudden intervention, retorted, Stay out of this! This man was ignoring my orders! The young woman, undeterred, stepped forward. I saw the whole thing. He clearly indicated that he's deaf. You can't arrest someone for not hearing you. Karen's face reddened with frustration. He should have made it clear from the start, she snapped. He did, the woman shot back, multiple times. You just didn't want to listen. A small crowd began to gather, drawn by the commotion. Whispers spread, and it was evident that the majority sided with the young woman and me. Some even began to record the incident on their phones. 
Feeling the pressure, Karen hesitated for a moment, her grip on my arm loosening. The young woman seized the opportunity. Release him! Now! Karen, realizing she was in the wrong, and with the growing audience against her, reluctantly unlocked the handcuffs. I rubbed my wrists, grateful for the timely intervention. Thank you, I mouthed to the young woman, my eyes filled with gratitude. She nodded, giving me a reassuring smile. No one should be treated like that, especially not because of a disability. The crowd slowly dispersed, but the incident left a lasting impression on everyone present. It was a stark reminder of the importance of understanding and empathy in a world filled with quick judgments. After the incident, the video from the park went viral, leading to a lot of discussions in the community about understanding and empathy. Karen faced consequences for her actions and the police department apologized. The event became a turning point for our town. Maya and I teamed up to start small awareness sessions in the park about disabilities, especially focusing on the deaf community. With time, these sessions became popular, and the park transformed into a place of learning and understanding. Years later, as I walked through the park, I was heartened to see children and adults alike using sign language, laughing, and communicating without barriers. The incident with Karen, though unfortunate, had paved the way for a more inclusive and understanding community. Police officers should not only be educated about disabled individuals, but also trained to maintain their composure in challenging situations. It is crucial for law enforcement to understand and respect the rights of people with disabilities, ensuring that misunderstandings and unnecessary confrontations are minimized. By fostering empathy and providing comprehensive training, we can create a society where everyone is treated with dignity and understanding, regardless of their abilities. I always thought I knew my family, my siblings, and the love we shared. But on the eve of my wedding, a shocking revelation tore through the facade, shattering my identity and leaving me questioning everything. Secrets, lies, and a hidden truth unfolded, leading to a decision that would forever change the course of my life. Here's how it all went down. I was 23, on the cusp of a new chapter in my life, marriage. But as the date drew closer, the weight of past memories pressed down on me. I have four older siblings, all significantly older than me. Each of them had chosen to have child-free weddings, and because of that, I, their younger sister, had never been invited to any of them. I still recall the day my eldest brother announced his wedding. I was just a ten-year-old, brimming with excitement. So when's the big day? I asked eagerly, imagining myself in a pretty dress, watching him say, I do. He hesitated, then replied, it's an adult-only event, kiddo. I was crushed. But she's like a sister to me, I protested, referring to his fiancée. I want to be there, he sighed. I know it's hard, but it's just how we planned it. Two years later, history repeated itself. My other brother was getting married. You remember how it was with our eldest brother, right, he said, trying to break it to me gently. I nodded, fighting back tears. I'm not a kid anymore, I argued. I won't cause any trouble. He gave me a sad smile. It's not about that, it's just the theme we're going for. Then at 15, it was my sister's turn. She initially seemed open to having me there. But as the days went by, the pressure from the family became evident. Everyone's saying how peaceful it is without kids, she told me one day. Hopeful, I asked. So can I come? I'm almost 16. She took a deep breath. We've set the age limit to 16. No exceptions. I felt a surge of anger. So every other kid's more important than your own sister? She looked pained. It's not like that. If I let you in, others will ask why their kids weren't allowed. In frustration, I shouted, I've missed every single family wedding. How is that fair? My parents, overhearing, intervened. Instead of support, they reprimanded me for my outburst and sent me to my room. By the time my last brother got married when I was 17, I had built a wall around my heart. I expected the child-free rule. I expected the exclusion. My step-cousin, who had just turned 18, was invited, but not me. I didn't make a fuss. I simply sent a brief congrats and retreated to my room, where I found solace in the company of the man who would soon become my husband. My parents were furious at my lack of enthusiasm, but by then I had learned to shield myself from their expectations. Now, as I stand on the brink of my own wedding, I need to decide on my wedding guest list. I knew there were names I wouldn't be writing down, my siblings. It was a conscious choice, a reflection of the pain I had felt when I was excluded from their weddings. When the invitations went out and they realized they weren't on the list, they stormed my house, demanding an explanation. I faced them, my heart pounding but my resolve firm. Remember when you all decided I wasn't old enough to be part of your weddings? I began, my voice quivering slightly. Well now I'm making a choice, you won't be part of mine. 
Their faces registered shock, but I continued, Do you have any idea how it felt, watching from the outside, knowing I wasn't wanted at my own siblings' weddings? My eldest brother tried to reason, Look, our weddings had alcohol. We didn't think it was a place for kids. I scoffed. It's not about the alcohol, it's about family. All I wanted was to be there, to share in the joy, to be part of the memories. I didn't care about the after party or the drinks. Then, my mother, in a voice dripping with indignation, interjected, How can you do this? We're family. We should be together on such an important day. I looked at her, the irony of her words stinging. Funny you should say that now, I retorted. Where was this sentiment when I was left out time and again? I took a deep breath, steadying myself. This is my wedding, my choice. And while I hear your reasons, you need to hear mine too. It's time you all felt what I felt. Now, as I reflect on it all, I can't help but wonder, am I the jerk here, or is it just the consequence of years of feeling left out? The next day, I called them all for a sit-down. The atmosphere was thick with tension as I began, I'll reconsider the invitations, but only if you're honest with me. No more hiding, no more lies. They exchanged uneasy glances, and the room was filled with an oppressive silence. Finally, my eldest brother cleared his throat. We're not exactly your siblings. My heart raced. What do you mean? He hesitated. You're our cousin. Your dad, our uncle, was raising you alone. When he died, our family took you in. My mind reeled, trying to process the information. And my mother? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. He shook his head. We don't know. The weight of the revelation was suffocating. All these years I had believed them to be my siblings, but in reality, I was just the orphaned cousin they had to look after. My brother's voice broke through my thoughts. There were times, times I resented you, times I even hated the situation. I looked around the room, my eyes landing on my parents. Their faces were a mix of guilt and sorrow. My cousin, who had been invited to the wedding I was excluded from, shifted uncomfortably in his seat. The betrayal, the years of lies, it was all too much. Without another word, I stood up and left, the weight of the truth heavy on my shoulders. In the midst of all this chaos, my partner and I had a heart-to-heart. -heart. We realized that the grand wedding, the spectacle, wasn't for us. It was more about what we thought the other wanted. But deep down, we both yearned for something intimate, something that was just about us. So, we eloped. It was a serene day, surrounded by a few close friends, away from all the drama. And the money we saved, we're using it to visit our dream country. Of course, my parents were livid that there was no grand celebration. But honestly, I couldn't care less. It was our day, and it was perfect. Wow, families can be such a tangled web sometimes. It's heartbreaking to see someone discover truths like that, especially when they've been in the dark for so long. I genuinely hope she finds the strength to navigate through this and comes out stronger. Life throws curveballs, but it's all about how we catch them and move forward. I never thought my love for Benjamin would lead me down a path of deception and guilt. Little did I know, the secret I kept hidden from my parents would unravel in ways I never anticipated. Here's how it all went down. The first time I saw Benjamin, he was passionately explaining the beauty of Argentine tango to a group of friends. Born in America, his roots trace back to Argentina, and he carries the essence of its culture in his heart. He speaks Spanish with a fluidity that's music to my ears, indulges in traditional Argentine dishes, and celebrates customs that have been passed down through generations. But if you looked at him, with his light skin and European features, you'd never guess he was Latino. His name, Benjamin, doesn't give it away either. I've never had an issue with Benjamin's heritage. In fact, I've always admired the richness of his culture. But my parents, they're a different story. Their conservative beliefs have often bordered on prejudice, especially when it comes to Latinos. They've got this skewed notion that all Latinos are criminals. I still remember the tension in the air when my brother introduced his girlfriend from Brazil. The disapproving glances, the hushed whispers, it was all too evident. As Benjamin and I approached the day he'd meet my parents, I felt a knot in my stomach. One evening, as we sat on my couch, I hesitated before saying, Ben, I need to ask you something. He looked at me, concern evident in his eyes. What's up? I know it's not right, but could you maybe not mention your Latino background when you meet my parents? I asked, my voice quivering. He looked taken aback. Why? I sighed. They have certain biases. I just don't want them to judge you based on that. He paused, processing my words. All right, he finally said, a hint of sadness in his voice. For you, I'll do it. The dinner started off on a pleasant note. Laughter, stories, and the clinking of glasses filled the room. But as the main course was served, my father, with a curious glint in his eye, asked, So, Benjamin, Rossi is an interesting surname. Where is it from? Benjamin hesitated for a split second before replying, It's Italian. My grandparents were from Italy. My father raised an eyebrow. Really? For a moment there, I thought you were one of those illegals. He chuckled, but no one else did. My mother, sensing the tension, tried to lighten the mood but ended up adding fuel to the fire. Oh, those Latinos, always trying to sneak in, aren't they? 
Benjamin's face remained neutral, but I could see the hurt in his eyes. He took a deep breath. Well, every culture has its beauty and its challenges. The drive back home was silent for the most part. The city lights blurred past us, mirroring the turmoil in my mind. Finally, Benjamin broke the silence, his voice filled with pain. I can't believe I agreed to hide who I am. It felt like a betrayal to myself. I gripped the steering wheel tighter. I'm so sorry, Ben. I thought it would make things easier. He looked out of the window. But at what cost? My dignity? I felt a pang of guilt. My parents loved Benjamin, but their prejudices clouded their judgment. I was torn between my love for him and my loyalty to my family. How could I choose between the two most important parts of my life? The weight of my actions pressed heavily on my chest, making it hard to breathe. Every time I replayed the dinner scene in my mind, the realization hit me harder. In my attempt to protect Benjamin from my parents' prejudices, I had unknowingly become an accomplice to their bigotry. My silence, my passive acceptance, was as damaging as their overt racism. The guilt was suffocating. One evening I invited Benjamin over. The room was dimly lit, and the tension was palpable. I took a deep breath trying to find the right words. Benjamin, I began, my voice shaky. I'm so, so sorry. I should have never asked you to hide who you are. He looked at me, his deep brown eyes searching mine. You know, I thought you were different, he said, his voice tinged with hurt. But asking me to deny my heritage? That hurt more than any racist comment. I felt a lump in my throat. I know, I whispered. I was trying to protect you, but I realized now that I was just being a coward. He took a moment, then said, I get it. You were scared, but it felt like you were ashamed of me. Tears welled up in my eyes. I'm not ashamed of you, Ben. I'm ashamed of myself and of my parents. I should have stood up to them from the start. He sighed, running his fingers through his hair. It's not entirely your fault. It's the environment you were raised in. But now that you see it, what are you going to do about it? I took his hands in mine. I'm going to make it right, starting with confronting my parents, and I promise, I'll never let anyone make you feel less than the amazing person you are. He gave a weak smile, pulling me into a hug. I just hope it's not too late for us. The sun was high in the sky, casting a warm glow over the restaurant's patio, but inside, the atmosphere was icy cold. I'd asked my parents to meet me for lunch, knowing that I had to address the elephant in the room. As we settled into our seats, I could feel the weight of the impending conversation. So, did you like Benjamin? I began, trying to gauge their feelings. They exchanged glances before nodding in agreement. Encouraged, I took a deep breath and said, There's something I need to tell you about him. My mother raised an eyebrow, her gaze sharp. What is it? He's Latino, I blurted out. The silence that followed was thick and suffocating. I could hear the distant chatter of other diners, but at our table, not a word was spoken. I had expected anger, maybe even a loud outburst, but this silence? It was far more unnerving. Finally, my father cleared his throat. So, you're dating one of them? He said, his voice dripping with disdain. My mother chimed in, her tone pleading. Honey, why? There are so many good boys out there. Why choose someone like that? I felt a surge of anger. Because he's a good person, Mom. Why can't you see past his ethnicity? My father leaned forward, his eyes cold. We've seen their kind. They put on a good show at first, but you'll see their true colors soon enough. I clenched my fists, trying to keep my composure. Dad, you're talking about an entire group of people based on stereotypes. Benjamin is not a stereotype. He's kind, loving, and genuine, my mother sighed. We just want what's best for you. And I want what's best for me, too, I shot back. And right now, that's Benjamin. The argument went back and forth, with neither side willing to budge. The more they spoke, the more I realized how deep-rooted their prejudices were, and the more determined I became to stand my ground. Finally, unable to take it any longer, I stood up. I love you both, but I won't let your biases dictate my life. With that, I walked away. As I left the restaurant, a mix of emotions washed over me. There was guilt for not seeing their prejudices sooner, pride for standing up for what I believed in, and a deep sadness for the rift that had formed between us. But through it all, one thing was clear. I had chosen love over prejudice, and I wouldn't have it any other way. To my friends, thank you. Your words, whether supportive or critical, opened my eyes to my mistakes and the pain I'd inflicted on Benjamin. I'm not seeking forgiveness, but I hope my journey serves as a reminder that love should always triumph over prejudice. It's evident that cultural biases and personal relationships often intersect in complex ways. Navigating these dynamics requires both courage and introspection. This story serves as a testament to the challenges many face in bridging generational and cultural divides. Little did I know that beneath the surface of our seemingly ordinary family life, a web of deceit and manipulation was spinning. 
As my stepdad's mental issues intensified, his true motives began to unravel, leaving my mom and me trapped in a dangerous game where trust and financial stability hung in the balance. Here's how it all went down. From the moment I turned 19, I felt the weight of my stepdad's expectations on my shoulders. For 14 long years, our relationship had been a roller coaster. We had our ups and downs, but mostly, it was a ride filled with tension and unspoken words. I always tried to keep the peace, to respect him, even when he acted more like a petulant child than a 38-year-old man. The day I turned 18 was monumental, not just because I was stepping into adulthood, but because I had secured a position at a prestigious corporate firm. I remember coming home, the excitement bubbling within me, ready to share the news. But the atmosphere at home was about to undergo a seismic shift. One evening as we sat down for dinner, my stepdad, with a heavy sigh, began his tale. You won't believe what happened at work today, he started, his voice quivering with feigned distress. What happened? My mom asked, genuine concern evident in her eyes. He looked down, hesitating for a moment, then said, My boss, he's got it in for me. I can't do anything right in his eyes. I raised an eyebrow, skeptical. What did he do? He shot me a glare, clearly not expecting me to question him. It's not just him. Everyone's against me. They're all bullying me, making my life hell. My mom reached out, placing a comforting hand on his. Why would they do that? You've always been so dedicated to your job. He shrugged, avoiding her gaze. I don't know, but I can't take it anymore. I couldn't help but roll my eyes. It was always something with him, always a new drama. My mom, the true backbone of our family, had built her business from the ground up. Every morning she'd settle into her home office, managing her team and clients with grace and efficiency. She was the reason we lived comfortably, the reason we never wanted for anything. And then there was my stepdad. Despite earning a hefty paycheck, much more than my mom, he always seemed to harbor a chip on his shoulder. His resentment was palpable, especially when it came to how he treated my brother and me. One afternoon, after witnessing yet another instance of his blatant favoritism towards my brother, my mom confronted him. Why do you do that? She demanded, her voice filled with frustration. Why can't you treat both kids equally? He scoffed. He's my son. Why should I treat them the same? She took a deep breath, trying to keep her composure. Because they're both children, both deserving of love and attention. I watched the exchange, anger bubbling within me. Finally, I couldn't hold back any longer. Mom, I interjected, my voice firm. I don't want anything from him. I just want peace in this house. She looked at me, her eyes filled with a mix of sadness and understanding. I know, she whispered, pulling me into a tight embrace. I know. One evening, after yet another heated exchange with my stepdad, I found solace in the confines of my room. I could still hear the muffled voices from downstairs, but I tried to drown them out. Sitting on the edge of my bed, I let out a deep sigh. Why all the drama? I murmured to myself, feeling the weight of years of deception and tension. Why can't he just be real for once? The morning sun streamed through my window, signaling a new day. As I got ready for work, I looked at my reflection in the mirror. Enough is enough, I told myself. I won't let his drama define me. I was determined to carve out my own path, free from his manipulative games. Time seemed to fly, and soon my 20th birthday was on the horizon. But instead of the usual excitement, a cloud of uncertainty hung over our home. My stepdad's stories became more outlandish by the day. One moment he'd talk about seeking therapy, and the next, he'd weave a tale about his boss wanting him dead, forcing him to leave the country. His sporadic disappearances became the norm, and each return was marked by a fresh set of excuses. I had envisioned my birthday to be a joyous occasion, a milestone marking two decades of growth and resilience. But as the date neared, my stepdad's theatrics took center stage. He waltzed back into our lives, spinning a narrative of how he was no longer fit to work, implying that the financial responsibility now fell on us. My thoughts immediately went to my mom. She had been our rock, our constant. Even after enduring multiple brain surgeries, she never wavered in her commitment to us. She managed every expense, every responsibility without a word of complaint. And now he expected her to pick up his slack. It was the last straw. Her voice, usually so calm, held a note of finality as she said, I can't do this anymore. We need to talk about a divorce. Just when I thought things couldn't get any more complicated, my step-grandmother decided to throw her hat into the ring. She stormed into our home one evening, her face red with anger. How can you be so cold-hearted? She accused, pointing a trembling finger at us. Don't you see what my son is going through? I clenched my fists, trying to keep my composure. But when she said, you should be thanking him for being there for you, for playing the role of a father, I couldn't hold back. Father figure? I scoffed, my voice dripping with sarcasm. He couldn't even be a proper father to his own son. What makes you think he was any different with me? She looked taken aback, but I wasn't done. You have no idea what goes on in this house, so before you come here pointing fingers, maybe get your facts straight. But the drama took an unexpected turn when I discovered she was bad-mouthing me at work. The whispers, the sidelong glances, the hushed conversations that stopped when I walked by, 
it was all becoming too much. We worked in the same office, and while I tried to keep things professional, it was clear she had other plans. One evening, a colleague pulled me aside. Hey, just thought you should know. Your step-grandma's been saying some pretty wild stuff about you. I sighed, rubbing my temples. Thanks for the heads up. The dilemma was real. Should I go to HR? She was on the brink of retirement, and part of me wondered if it was worth stirring the pot. But another voice inside me whispered, enough is enough. Late at night, as I sat on my bed, the weight of the situation pressing down on me, I realized this wasn't just about family drama. It was about standing up for myself, about not letting others define me. And with newfound determination, I decided that no matter what, I'd face this head on and come out stronger on the other side. The days leading up to my birthday were a whirlwind of emotions. The rumors at work grew louder and the tension at home was palpable. But amidst all the chaos, I found solace in my friends and the few family members who stood by me. They became my anchor, reminding me of my worth and urging me to stay strong. The night of my birthday party arrived, and it was everything I had hoped for. Friends, laughter, music, and a sense of camaraderie that made all the recent troubles seem distant. As the night wore on, I took a moment to step outside, needing a breath of fresh air, the cool breeze felt soothing, and I looked up at the starry sky, lost in thought. To my surprise, my mom joined me. She wrapped an arm around me and we stood there in silence for a while. You know, she began, life has a way of testing us, but it's these tests that show us who we truly are. She paused, taking a deep breath. I've decided to go through with the divorce. It's time we both found our peace. I hugged her tightly, tears streaming down both our faces. It was a moment of closure, of new beginnings. The next day I walked into HR and reported my step-grandmother's behavior. They took immediate action, ensuring a safe and respectful work environment for all. She was given a stern warning, and while she did retire a few months later, the rumors and whispers ceased. Life slowly returned to normal. My mom and I grew closer, finding strength in each other. We moved to a new place, leaving behind the memories of the past and looking forward to a brighter future. My stepdad and his mother faded into the background, becoming distant memories. As the years went by, I often looked back at that tumultuous time, realizing that it was a turning point in my life. It taught me the importance of standing up for oneself, of choosing peace over chaos, and most importantly, of cherishing the bonds that truly matter. Man, families can be complicated, can't they? It's like a roller coaster sometimes. But hey, it's all about how you handle the ups and downs. Props to the protagonist for standing their ground. It takes a lot of strength to navigate through such challenging situations and come out stronger on the other side. Let this be a reminder that we have the power to shape our own destiny and surround ourselves with those who truly support and uplift us. It started as a routine trip to the grocery store, just another mundane Saturday morning. Little did I know that this seemingly ordinary day would take a dramatic turn. Karen demands I pay her bail after I got her arrested. Here's how it all went down. It was supposed to be an average Saturday morning. However, fate had other plans. Upon entering the grocery store, I immediately spotted Karen, our neighborhood's infamous drama queen. I rolled my eyes internally and made a mental note to keep my interactions with her brief. While in the dairy section, I was startled by a high-pitched, Oh, hi, fancy seeing you here. I turned to find Karen. Hey, Karen, I replied, opting for politeness. Making my selections, I left my cart a little farther away. I didn't think much of it until I noticed Karen hastily moving away from it, her quick glance in my direction. Fast forward to the checkout counter, and my heart sank. Money was missing from my wallet. Connect the dots, and the picture was clear. Karen. Could we check the CCTV footage? I asked the cashier, trying to remain calm. There she was, captured on screen, reaching into my wallet like a modern-day pickpocket on a high-stakes heist mission. Her fingers moved with a practiced precision, extracting several bills that I had tucked away for safekeeping. It was a scene right out of a thriller movie. Only this time, the perpetrator wasn't some cunning mastermind, but our very own neighborhood Karen. As the incriminating video footage played before my eyes, I couldn't help but shake my head in disbelief. Karen had always been a source of entertainment with her over-the-top complaints about the height of my hedges and the volume of my lawnmower. Confronting Karen about her theft didn't go quite as smoothly as one might expect. She stammered, attempting to explain away her criminal act. It was a mistake, she protested, but the evidence against her was as solid as a rock, and I was not about to let her escape the consequences of her actions. I swiftly dialed 911, and within minutes, our peaceful suburban street was swarming with police officers. Karen was handcuffed, and her dramatic protest filled the air much to the delight of our nosy neighbors who had gathered to witness the spectacle. As she was escorted away in the back of a police car, her once immaculate facade of a suburban soccer mom crumbled. You can't do this to me! I have book club on Thursday! Karen shrieked. One of the police officers attempted to calm her down, saying, Ma'am, please, we have procedures to follow. Karen, still in the midst of her dramatic performance, replied, Procedures? You should be chasing real criminals, not innocent suburban housewives like me. 
A neighbor from across the street couldn't resist chiming in. Innocent, we all saw the security footage, Karen. Undaunted, Karen kept going with her angry outburst. This is all a conspiracy. You're all against me. You, officer, you must have a vendetta against my petunias. The officer exchanged a confused look with his partner, clearly unsure of how to react to Karen's ridiculous accusation. As the police car drove off, Karen's cries of injustice echoed down the street, leaving us all stunned by the sheer audacity of her casual delusions. The next morning, I found myself contemplating whether or not to answer the call from Karen. Despite my hesitation, curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to pick up the phone. And there she was, demanding that I pay her bail in a desperate and entitled tone. It was almost comical how she expected me to come to her rescue after stealing from me. I couldn't help but express my at her audacity. But then, in a sudden shift of tone, Karen tried to play the friendship card, insincerely claiming that we were neighbors and even friends. It was clear that her attempts to manipulate me were nothing more than a desperate move. Feeling my patience wearing thin, I firmly reminded Karen that being neighbors didn't give her the right to take what wasn't hers. I emphasized that she needed to face the consequences of her actions. However, Karen was relentless. She went on a monologue, trying to justify her criminal behavior with tales of misfortunes and woes. From broken dishwashers to wilting petunias, she painted a picture of a collapsing world, as if these hardships excused her theft. As I heard her wild stories, I couldn't help but shake my head in disbelief. It was like Karen was on a mission to constantly outdo herself, diving deeper into a realm of absurdity. The more she spoke, the more apparent it became that Karen's entitlement knew no bounds. She genuinely believed that I, as her neighbor, was obligated to rescue her from the consequences of her actions. Her audacity was both infuriating and astonishing. In the end, I politely but firmly refused her request for bail money. It was clear that Karen had crossed a line and her chaotic behavior showed no signs of stopping. You'll regret this, she snapped. Hanging up the phone, I pondered the audacity of some people. It was clear that in Karen's world, everything revolved around her. It was a hard lesson, but maybe this incident would finally teach her to think of others before herself. The entitlement is strong with this one. Karen really thought OP would come to her rescue after stealing from them? Delusional much? I always knew there was something off about my relationship with my dad, but I never expected it to lead to a series of shocking revelations. From overheard conversations to hidden desires, my world turned upside down in an instant. Little did I know that the truth would unfold in a dramatic sequence of events that would forever change our lives. Here's how it all went down. I, 17 years old female, am not very close with my father, 41 years old male, due to him not wanting to spend much time with me. When I was little, my mom, 39 years old female, and I did lots of fun activities together, and she always played with me and entertained me, resulting in us having a good relationship now. However, whenever I'd try to get my dad to play with me or watch something with me, he'd be uninterested and tell me to go play with my mom. This happened practically every day when I wanted to watch him work on his car or ask him to play, but he always pushed me away. As I grew up, I believed that my dad just didn't like me, so I asked him to play or teach me stuff less and less. He would only do things with me on my birthday and holidays. However, he always made sure I was fed when I was hungry, and if I was upset, he'd comfort me. Other than that, he would avoid me. The soft hum of the refrigerator filled the air as I stood in the kitchen, munching on a snack. The day had been uneventful until that moment when my ears perked up at the sound of my dad's voice coming from the open kitchen window. He was in the backyard, engaged in a conversation with one of his friends, and I hadn't been intentionally eavesdropping, but something in his tone and the mention of my name drew me in. Yeah, you know, it's just, I wish I had a son. My dad's voice carried through the warm breeze, tinged with a hint of regret. I paused mid-chew, my curiosity getting the better of me. What could he possibly be discussing that involved me in this way? I leaned closer to the window, trying to catch every word. His friend's voice on the other end crackled with curiosity. Why's that, man? My heart sank as my dad continued. I never wanted a girl, to be honest. I don't know how to relate to them, and I've never really tried. It's not that I don't love her, but it's just different. My hand holding the snack trembled slightly as I processed what I was hearing. The conversation was intense in its casualness, revealing a side of my dad I hadn't known existed. I felt like I had stumbled upon a hidden chapter of my family's story. His friend, clearly taken aback, probed further. Did you ever talk to her about it? My dad sighed. Nah, not really. I figured it was easier to just let her be. I even tried to get her mom to have another kid hoping for a son, but she didn't want another child at the time, so I kind of just let her take care of her and I focused on other things. The words hung heavy in the air. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, that my dad had quietly wished for something else and that it had shaped our relationship or lack thereof. It was like discovering a secret about myself that I had never been aware of, and it left me feeling a mix of confusion, sadness, and even a touch of anger. 
From the backyard, the conversation continued, unaware that I was listening. My dad's casual admission had cast a new light on our past interactions and raised a slew of questions about our future. As I continued to stand there, my snack forgotten, I couldn't help but wonder how I would approach this revelation and whether my dad would ever be willing to bridge the gap between us that had been formed by his unspoken desire for a son. I went to my room after hearing this. I want to tell my mom how hurt I feel, but I also don't want to cause an argument between them since they are really close. What I should do? Should I ask him about it or just tell my mom? So a few days later, my mom got home from work and I waited until she wasn't busy to talk to her. I asked her to come with me to my room and once we were both in there with the door closed, I told her what I overheard and how I felt. I shared not only about his hurtful words but also how I felt my whole life with how he treated me like I'm a stranger. My mom was quiet as I talked and once I finished, she hugged me and told me how she's really sorry. She hugged me while telling me how I'm the best thing to ever happen to her and that it didn't matter that I'm a girl because she'd love me either way. She emphasized that's how parents should be and that she'd always be there for me. After a bit, she went to confront my dad who admitted it. They got into an argument from it which ended with him going to stay at my grandma's house for a bit. I forgot to mention, but my mom also told me how she's been doing her best to fill both roles of my mom and dad since my dad wasn't. The next night, my dad came home and my mom was hesitant to let him into the house. However, he said he needed to talk, so she let him in. He, my mom and I sat in the living room and he started apologizing for what had happened. He told my mom and me that he regretted what he said and would step up to be a better father to me and make things right. My mom told him that what he did was not acceptable in any way and that apologizing wouldn't fix it. I then asked how exactly he planned to make up for ignoring me throughout my whole childhood and not being a dad to me. I mentioned that I would be turning 18 in a couple of months and would no longer be a child. I also expressed that ignoring me and pushing me away because of my gender was a horrible thing, and I don't forgive him. He started apologizing more and had some tears in his eyes which sort of surprised me, but my mom asked me to head to my room so I did, and I could hear my mom saying stuff, and then my dad leave the house again. She came into my room after and told me that she would be not allowing him in our home anymore, and gave me a hug before telling me that she texted his mom the night he left for a few days about what happened, and apparently my grandma tore into him about it and kicked him out so he had to stay at one of his friend's house. It was a month since that intense conversation between my dad and his friend. I was at home, recovering from a recent accident, and watching some Mandalorian for distraction. The TV was buzzing with blaster fire and adventures, taking my mind off the crazy month I'd had. Little did I know, more unexpected drama was about to unfold. As I lay in bed, I heard a series of knocks on the front door. I was curious, but cautious as I opened the door to find my dad standing there. His left eye was all red like he'd been in a fight. I let him in but decided to keep our conversation outside. He started apologizing and then tried to guilt me into getting my mom to let him back into our lives. I wasn't too keen on that idea and told him so. This got him upset, and he began venting about his own problems. But honestly, I wasn't all that interested. I just wanted to get this conversation over with. Then, out of nowhere, he dropped a bombshell. He said he hadn't really cared about raising me because I wasn't a boy. According to him, my gender determined whether or not I was his child. I was dumbfounded trying to wrap my head around his absurd logic. I told him he was completely wrong but he got angry and slapped me. That's when I decided to push him away and shut the door, locking it behind me. I called my mom right away and she called the police. Meanwhile, my dad was outside screaming and trying to get back in. It was a surreal and scary situation. The police showed up pretty quickly and they had to take my dad to the hospital because he hurt his wrist when he fell off the porch. Then they arrested him for hitting me, which was all caught on our security cameras. The night had turned into a crazy ordeal that none of us saw coming. My dad's actions not only damaged our family, but also led to serious consequences for himself. It was a night that left me with both physical and emotional pain, something I never thought I'd have to deal with. My mom had been comforting me the past week because I had to deal with that, and now we are okay. The issue is that he likely understands the process of conception logically, however, he chose to avoid facing his lack of desire for a daughter and instead convinced himself of a baseless narrative. This behavior can be likened to cheaters who distort their spouse's character in their own minds to avoid accepting their own wrongdoing. It is remarkable how far someone can delude themselves into believing these fallacies instead of acknowledging their own faults. I never thought a simple favor for my mom would turn my life into a chaotic feline nightmare. With a cramped studio apartment, a strict no pets allowed policy and my sanity hanging by a thread, I reluctantly agreed to take care of her army of cats. Little did I know it would lead to a battle against fur, odor, and sleepless nights. Here's how it all went down. So you know, my mom and my little sis are all set to move to United Kingdom in a few weeks. 
Mom decided to sell our grandpa's place because it wasn't needed anymore, but she kind of didn't plan that out too well. She didn't line up a place to crash after selling the house because she didn't think it'd sell so darn fast. So she ended up bunking with my big sis without even asking. Just kind of assumed they'd let her crash, which they did after a bit of convincing. At first, she wanted to crash at my spot with my little sis, but I had to explain it's totally impossible because I'm in this tiny studio apartment, you know, just one room for everything. After a few arguments, she finally agreed that I could take care of the cats until she figures out a temporary foster home for them. I was like, Mom, seriously, my place is way too cramped for all of us. And she was like, but what about your sister and me? I said, there's legit no space and you know how cramped it gets. After a bit of back and forth, she sighed and said, okay, fine, you keep the cats for now. So, that's where we're at. Cats chilling at my place and mom and sis squeezing into my big sis's spot. My mom, man, she's a champ at procrastinating. She's been dragging her feet on sorting out what to do with her army of cats. I mean, she's got like over a dozen of them, but she's only taking five on her trip to the UK. The others found new homes, thankfully. Now these cats, they're a handful. And my little studio apartment is getting real cramped with them around. I tried telling my mom that I could take a few, but not all of them. Plus, my lease straight up says no pets allowed. So I was like, sorry, can't do it. But then she went off on a whole rant about how she's helped me out a bunch in the past. And you know how it is with family. You can't say no forever. To make things even more interesting, I got an email from my landlord saying they know about the cat invasion in my place and that I need to ditch them ASAP. Thankfully, they understood when I explained the whole situation and that it's just a temporary thing to help my mom out. Man, I thought they'd crash at my place for a couple of weeks, but it's been pushing two months now. These cats, they've turned my pad into a feline fiesta. The smell is unreal and they've turned my carpeted stairs into their personal scratching post. I can't catch a break. They climb up to the window ledge, knocking stuff over, and the late night ruckus is driving me nuts. I've even slept through my university classes because I'm running on fumes thanks to these party animals. Now don't get me wrong, my partner doesn't mind cats, but there's a limit. Waking up to a cat acrobatics show at 3am is not what I signed up for. And the stench? Oh man, it's a constant issue. No matter how many times I scoop their litter boxes, one of them keeps using my wardrobe as a personal restroom, despite my best efforts to keep it closed. I've tried to be reasonable here. I mean, I'm all for helping out, but enough is enough. I told my mom that I can't keep these cats indefinitely and suggested checking out boarding kennels. But she's acting like they have these specific, super complicated requirements that no one can meet. I've done my homework on boarding kennels, but she won't even consider it. I've tried explaining how they work, but she's put up this wall, and it's frustrating as heck. And every time I bring it up, she hits me with the family helps each other line. Even my sisters are piling on. The youngest and the oldest, they're both calling me selfish for not being a full-time cat hotel. It's like I'm stuck between a rock and a furball. I'm just trying to get some peace and quiet and not wake up to find my wardrobe turned into a litter box, you know? But somehow, that makes me the bad guy. I get it. Family should help each other out, but it's got to be a two-way street. I've tried compromising, offered a solution, but they're not having it. At this point, I'm just counting down the days until those cats find a new place to crash, and my place can go back to being my sanctuary. Until then, it's the battle of the fur and the odor, and it's wearing me down. So, am I a jerk for wanting to get rid of my mother's cats? It may be worth considering discussing with your sisters the possibility of them taking in all the cats, since you are facing challenges in your apartment and want to avoid any issues that may arise. If they express any concerns or objections, you could remind them of the saying, put your money where your mouth is, or shut the hell up. Given the situation, you might need to explore options for finding new homes for the cats on your own, as it seems unlikely that your mother will take action to address the situation. I never expected that my simple desire to spend Christmas with my fiancé's family in South Korea would ignite such a firestorm of emotions and conflict with my own mother. As tensions rise and the holiday draws near, I find myself caught in a web of expectations and familial obligations. Here's how it all went down. My fiancé and I are thinking about spending Christmas in South Korea with his family. We met when he was here on a student visa, but sadly he was denied a visa when he went back to his country. He's going for another interview in November, and if that doesn't work out, we'll proceed with the K-1 fiancé visa. Luckily, my job gives me five months of vacation throughout the year, so I can visit South Korea quite often. When he gets approved for the K-1, he'll come back here, and I know the waiting time is getting shorter. My parents are aware of all these plans, and they support me spending Christmas with him if his next visa gets denied. My fiancé has made it clear that he wants to cover all the costs of my ticket when I travel to South Korea. I'll be there from December 22nd to the 30th or 31st. Unfortunately, I can't stay longer due to work, as that's the only vacation time I have in December. My fiancé might be working while I'm there, but I don't mind at all. 
We'll spend time together after he finishes work, usually around 6.30 or 7 p.m. What matters most to me is that we get to be together. It's going to be a low-key, relaxing vacation so we won't be doing anything too touristy. My mom knows I might be going and she said, You're thinking of going to a country where people don't even celebrate Christmas? She looked concerned, adding, I didn't realize Christmas meant nothing to you. Your absence might just ruin the holiday for us. I tried to suggest a nice dinner before I leave or after I return, saying, How about we have a special dinner together? But she quickly shot it down, saying, It won't be the same. Frustrated, I asked, So, do you want to have nothing at all then? I was just trying to find a compromise that would allow us to celebrate the holiday, in some way. To add to the drama, she told me that she mentioned to her friend that I wouldn't be here for Christmas, and her friend reacted dramatically, saying, No, not Christmas, she has to be here. I can't handle all the theatrics. It's not like my fiancé doesn't have family who probably wants to see me, too. I even tried explaining this to her, but she responded with, Koreans aren't Christmas people, so it shouldn't matter to his parents. She took it a step further, saying, Your fiancé should be more respectful towards you and your family, understanding how important Christmas is to us. Her concern also extended to his financial decisions, and she worried about our future because of the way he handles money. Then she even tried to convince me to suggest Europe to him instead, saying, They celebrate Christmas there. And she kept emphasizing how going to Korea would be a waste of money, not to mention how I'd be jet-lagged when I come back. I firmly responded, it's his money, and it's ultimately up to us where we want to celebrate Christmas. I added that if jet lag becomes a problem, I'll use one of my sick days. Besides, we're planning on having a relaxing vacation, not something too action-packed. The other day, I found myself in a conversation with my dad, and my mom happened to overhear us. I was sharing with him how my fiancé's mom had expressed her strong desire for me to spend Christmas with their family, no matter what. I couldn't help but feel touched by the warmth of her invitation, and I mentioned to my dad how nice it is to know how much she likes me. Of course, my mom couldn't resist chiming in. She asserted, she needs to know Christmas is important to us. I, however, had a different perspective and replied, that means nothing. She's allowed to miss me. My mom didn't let it go and insisted that Christmas holds significant importance for us and my fiancé's mom should make an exception. I pushed back gently, explaining that I believe there's no need for exceptions. My fiancé's mom is simply a lovely person who genuinely wants to spend time with me during the holidays. It's about connection and family, and I believe it's something worth celebrating, even if it means celebrating away from home. As the holiday season approaches, I find myself torn about what to do if my fiancé and I end up celebrating Christmas in Korea. I wonder if my mom is trying to make a point that I might be missing. Is she just expressing her concerns, or does she genuinely have a say in telling me what to do? These are the questions swirling in my mind as I navigate this delicate situation, hoping to find a balance that works for everyone involved. South Korea boasts a Christian population numbering in the millions, actually surpassing the entire population of Canada. Despite this significant Christian presence, Christmas celebrations in South Korea tend to be less commercialized, often emphasizing church attendance and family gatherings over extravagant gift-giving, highlighting the cultural differences in holiday observances. As I took my war veteran grandfather to the park, little did I know that our peaceful outing would turn into a shocking battle. Suddenly, Karen steals my grandfather's wheelchair, cause she's fat and needs it more. Here's how it all went down. It was a sunny day, and I decided to take my grandfather, a war veteran, to the park. He had recently been confined to a wheelchair due to an old war injury that had worsened over time. We found a nice spot with benches, and he preferred sitting on them rather than staying in his wheelchair. It was more comfortable for him, especially when eating. So we parked the wheelchair beside our bench, its handles adorned with colorful stickers I had given him over the years. I went to grab some ice cream for both of us, leaving my grandfather enjoying the sun and the gentle breeze. As I was waiting in line, I noticed a woman eyeing the wheelchair. She was on the heavier side, with a scowl that seemed permanent. I didn't think much of it, assuming she was just curious about the stickers. When I returned, my grandfather looked distressed. The wheelchair's gone, he said, pointing to the empty space beside the bench. Panicking, I scanned the area. It didn't take long to spot the wheelchair. It was unmistakable with its unique stickers. The woman I had seen earlier was now sitting in it, a smug look on her face. Hey! I called out, approaching her with my grandfather slowly following behind. That's our wheelchair! She looked up feigning innocence. Oh, I thought it was abandoned. I need it more than whoever left it here. That's my grandfather's wheelchair, I said, pointing to the stickers. Those are the stickers I gave him. You can't just take it, she scoffed. Look at me. I can barely walk because of my weight. I need this wheelchair more than some old man. My grandfather, ever the gentleman, tried to reason with her. Ma'am, I understand it might be difficult for you, but that wheelchair is mine. It helps me move around. She rolled her eyes. You were sitting on the bench. Clearly you don't need it as much as I do. I was taken aback. 
Are you seriously trying to justify stealing a wheelchair from a war veteran? She smirked. Well, if he's a war veteran, he should know how to fight for what's his. I could feel my blood boiling. You can't just take things that aren't yours. She leaned forward, her voice dripping with sarcasm. Oh, can I? Just then, a park ranger approached us. Is there a problem here? The woman pointed at me. He's trying to take my wheelchair. The ranger looked at the stickers, then back at my grandfather. Ma'am, that's clearly not your wheelchair. She huffed. Well, I need it more than he does. The ranger raised an eyebrow. Ma'am, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. She looked outraged. This is discrimination. Just because I'm overweight doesn't mean I don't have rights. The ranger sighed. Ma'am, you're not being discriminated against. You're trying to take someone else's property. That's not allowed. She muttered something under her breath and reluctantly got up, leaving the wheelchair behind. The ranger turned to us. I'm sorry about that. Some people just don't understand. I nodded. Thank you for your help. He smiled. No problem. Enjoy your day. As we settled back down, my grandfather chuckled. Well, that was certainly interesting. I laughed. You can say that again. He smiled. It's a good thing you were here. I don't know what I would have done without you. I grinned. I'll always have your back, Grandpa. We sat in silence for a moment, enjoying our ice creams and the gentle breeze. It was a beautiful day, and despite the unexpected encounter, we were determined to make the most of it. Suddenly, the woman returned, this time with a group of her friends. This is the guy who tried to steal my wheelchair, she exclaimed, pointing at me. Her friends began to shout and jeer, creating a scene. My grandfather and I exchanged worried glances. The situation was escalating quickly. The park ranger, noticing the commotion, hurried over. Ma'am, I already told you to leave. If you don't, I'll have to call the police. She sneered. Go ahead. I'd love to see them try to arrest me. The ranger, true to his word, pulled out his radio and called for backup. Within minutes, a police car arrived and two officers stepped out. The woman's bravado quickly faded as she realized the gravity of the situation. Her friends, sensing trouble, began to disperse. The officers took statements from us and the park ranger. The woman, now subdued, was given a stern warning and escorted out of the park. My grandfather and I, still in shock, decided to head home. As we left the park, he turned to me and said, You know, in all my years, I've never seen anything quite like that. I nodded in agreement. Me neither, Grandpa. Me neither. And as we walked away, I couldn't help but feel grateful. Grateful for my grandfather, for the sacrifices he had made, and for the lessons he had taught me. And in that moment, I realized that no matter what challenges we faced, we would always face them together. Wow, what a crazy story. Can't believe someone would actually steal a wheelchair from a war veteran. Glad the park ranger and police stepped in to resolve the situation. Kudos to the person who stood up for their grandfather. Family is everything. I never imagined that the man I married, a pastor, would confess to an affair and ask me to raise his love child. The weight of his request crushed me, but what followed was a spiral into a world of disillusionment and self-discovery. Here's how it all went down. At 29, I found myself married to a man 15 years my senior. We met at the church I began attending after relocating for my job at an insurance company. He was the pastor there. Despite our age difference, he always treated me with kindness and made me feel cherished. One evening, he returned home with a heavy heart and a look I hadn't seen before. We need to talk, he began, his voice trembling. Through tears, he confessed to having an affair with a 34-year-old woman from our community. The weight of his words crushed me, but there was more. She had been pregnant with twins. Tragically, she and one of the babies had passed away during childbirth, leaving the other twin in the neonatal intensive care unit. We need to step up, he said, suggesting we convert my office into a nursery and set up a cot for us to take turns caring for the child. I was overwhelmed. I need time to think, I replied, my voice shaky. I'm not sure I can do this. He tried to appeal to our faith, reminding me of our marital vows and suggesting that God had blessed us with this child. God won't give us more than we can handle, he pressed. In my distress, I shot back. It seems God gave her more than she could handle since she's gone. I instantly regretted my words, but before I could apologize, his hand met my face in a sharp slap. You need to serve your husband, he said sternly. God chose you to be this child's mother. You must be his humble servant. I just feel so strange. Yesterday, I cried so hard I threw up. This woman died, yet I feel bad for myself. I feel so ugly. I wanted children and was saving for IVF because I'm infertile. But now that I have a chance to have a child and I do not want it, I feel like I'd be robbing its mother's grave. I pray to God, but if I'm being honest, it's never felt like anyone was ever listening. I feel like I have truly seen my husband, and he no longer looks kind. He looks his age and very tired. I want to abandon him and the child. I'm only 29. I can start over. I have a remote job. I can take a day off when he goes to the NICU. 
pack my essentials and leave. Neither him nor the child deserve this, and although this is my situation, that is not my problem. I'm still processing all of this, and I just need a little time. I don't feel unsafe, just unloved, just not enough. My husband did apologize for slapping me and continues to express regret, but he can't take it back. Just as he cannot take back impregnating another woman, which ultimately killed her. I'm feeling so disillusioned with my whole life right now, and I know I should leave. I know that there is a world out there that will not treat me like this. But I am scared of change. I am working on a plan to leave and getting my affairs in order for when I am ready to go, but I am not sure when I would leave if I choose to. Many express that I should make a report to the police about him slapping me, and they're probably right. But that would likely cause me more problems than it would be worth. If I leave, it might make him want to contest the divorce more. And if I stay, it would cause more tension. I've been working on my self-defense skills, though, because I won't let him get away with it again. I'm not violent myself, but I'm prepared to protect myself because although I'm hurt, I am angry. I'm not sure if there will be an update because I'm still unsure. I can make all the plans in the world, but the change scares me almost as much as succumbing to his will. I've been praying about it, but I see no clear answers or guidance. I don't know. Funny thing, I'm jealous of the people saying that this is fake. It's like I want my life to be like it was two weeks ago. I could read a crazy story on the internet and think, wow, that's crazy, seems kind of fake, and keep scrolling and go about my life. Only I can't scroll away in real life because that's just not how life works. I don't owe anyone proof of my life tragedies, least of all strangers on the internet whom I will never meet. I do thank all who have given support. I wish I could tell you I packed my bags and left his sorry jerk, but I'm not strong enough to yet. It's not that easy to do in real life as it turns out. Odd. Finally, I left. I didn't leave right away, as I know now that I should have. It just wasn't that easy. I stayed for two months. I knew if I did not at least try to make it work, I would not be able to live with it. Not because I wanted to save my marriage, but because what ifs keep me up at night enough as is. I went to marriage counseling with my husband, but it was ultimately fruitless. Of course, it was Christian counseling, and I felt like their goal was for me to forgive him rather than actually trying to help me. I was so utterly alone during that time. My parents and brother are also very religious, so even though they weren't happy with my husband, they kept urging me to do what a good Christian wife would do. I spent so much time suffering in my own head that I began to realize that I was just going through the motions, doing what I thought people expected of me. I entered a state of derealization for a time, and that was a difficult experience. The feeling of nothing being real, not even myself, was horrible. During this period, my husband brought his baby home, and while he tried to split the childcare responsibilities 50-50ths at first, he ultimately didn't trust me to look after the baby because I was lost in space. So he ended up being the primary caregiver. When I was with the baby, all I could think about was how its existence had a negative impact on my life. It would look at me with big blue eyes, and I would just wish it would disappear. I would actively spend time resenting the baby. There was a time when I was thinking to myself, and I wished it would stop breathing. That was when I knew that I needed to leave. I was blaming a baby and wishing harm upon it, and that was not okay to do. I don't remember much about this time besides that. It's mostly a blur otherwise. I sought services through my workplace to talk to a therapist, and I eventually came back to reality. She helped me make a plan. At no point did I fear my husband. I truly believe the slap was a one-off event. However, he doesn't deserve closure. On a night he had a long Bible study, he always took his baby with him because he didn't trust me. I packed my essentials and left. I met him pretty quickly after college, so I did not have much to take in terms of furnishings. I fit everything I wanted in three suitcases and four moving boxes. It all fit into my SUV after some mediocre Tetris skills. I was able to change my phone number online before I left, but I did leave the divorce papers under his pillow with my lawyer's contact information, kind of like the tooth fairy but for jerks. I was the breadwinner. In my state, we were not married long enough for me to pay spousal maintenance. At least that is what my lawyer said. I own my vehicle outright. We had our own bank accounts and a shared expenses account. We filed taxes separately, and the church owns the house. He's being difficult about it all, but I'm hoping it should be resolved soon. I got a decent apartment in a city a few hundred miles away. I've never lived in a city this big before. Everything is more expensive, but besides that, I like it. I found a new therapist, met some new friends, and found a new church with loving people. I still have my challenging days, but for the most part, I'm content. I think it will always hurt on some level, but I'm working on regaining my power. I turn 30 next month, and I am hopeful it will be the start of my best decade yet.
It takes tremendous courage to make the decision to leave and prioritize your own well-being. You're absolutely right. Your ex-husband cannot use God to absolve himself of his mistakes, and it's completely understandable that you didn't want to take on the responsibility of raising his affair child. It's important to remember that you deserve happiness and fulfillment in your life, and it's not your duty to bear the consequences of his actions. Stay strong and continue to prioritize yourself, sending you positive vibes and wishing you a bright future ahead. I never expected my husband's reaction to our baby's gender to spiral into an emotional roller coaster. Husband is melting down over gender disappointment, I typed, narrating the turbulent journey of our pregnancy. Little did I know that his initial disappointment would lead us down a path of self-reflection, fears, and ultimately, a newfound understanding. Here's how it all went down. I am 13 weeks and 5 days, and we had our first trimester screening last week with a non-invasive prenatal test, NIPT. We opted for all the genetic testing, and this morning they called and told us everything was normal, and we're having a girl. I am elated. I didn't have a gender preference. I believe all genders have their pros and cons, and children will be who they're meant to be. I suppose I'm more excited for the closure. At a time when so much is uncertain, we have an answer to one of the biggest questions we had. I told my husband, and he was happy at first, but mentioned he was a little disappointed because he wanted a boy. However, as the day goes on, he's been expressing his disappointment more intensely than he let on during the pregnancy. He would make little jokes about manifesting that the baby is a boy and tell people that he wants the baby to be a boy. He's been reading articles online about gender disappointment, which say that what he's going through is normal, but his disappointment runs deep. He took a deep breath. It's not about wanting a boy for the sake of it. It's just, I've seen the challenges here, especially in the Southeast. I thought maybe a boy wouldn't have to face some of them. I looked at him, trying to gauge the depth of his feelings. Every child has their own set of challenges, regardless of gender. He ran his fingers through his hair, frustrated. I know that. But think about the health care, the discrimination she might face being mixed race, or if she identifies as LGBTQ+. And then there's the fear of her being preyed upon. I nodded. Those are valid concerns, but they'd exist for a boy, too, in different ways. He looked away. I just, I wanted to give our child the best shot, you know? We still can, I replied. By being there, by educating, by preparing. We can't control everything, but we can control how we respond and prepare, he sighed. I just need some time to process this. Take all the time you need, I said, understanding that sometimes emotions aren't straightforward. He also mentioned feeling a diminished bond with our daughter due to sexist stereotypes, such as his concerns about her liking clothes shopping, the need to teach her modesty, and his belief that he can't teach her how to use the bathroom properly. I reassured him that children will have their own preferences, and it's possible to have a girl who enjoys trucks or a boy who likes to paint his nails. While we can influence their interests to some extent, ultimately, children will be who they are. Additionally, he expressed the belief that girls are harder to raise, coinciding with an incident involving our 12-year-old niece who got in trouble at school. I countered that it may not be fair to generalize based on our niece's behavior, as this is just a small sample size and not a valid scientific basis for such a claim. He then said that he was hoping for a boy because he wanted to be a better father to his son than his own deadbeat father was, and he was slightly insecure about his own masculinity and wanted a son to prove that he could be masculine and raise a masculine son. I said he should unpack that in therapy. He has a therapist he sees once a week on Thursdays. Have any of you dealt with this? I searched, but most of the gender disappointment posts were from the pregnant people themselves or relatives, friends, gender disappointment, but not the spouse. I like the advice that he'll feel differently when he holds her for the first time, but that's six months from now and I have to live with him that whole time, lol. I am trying to not let him ruin my day excitement, but it's tough. After what felt like an eternity, the day finally came when I gave birth to our beautiful daughter. The way he looked at her, the pure adoration in his eyes, was something I hadn't seen before. It was evident that he was head over heels in love with her, and any reservations he had before seemed to have melted away. One of the things that seemed to help him move past his initial gender disappointment was the fact that he got to choose her name. It gave him a sense of connection and involvement that was deeply personal. His therapist played a significant role in helping him navigate his feelings. Through their sessions, he came to understand that his anxiety wasn't so much about our daughter's gender, but more about the overwhelming reality of becoming a parent. The fact that we were having a girl made everything more tangible for him. He knew what it was like to be a boy, but the idea of raising a girl was unfamiliar territory. It was the double whammy of stepping into the unknown world of parenting and doing so with a gender he didn't personally experience. But as the days went by, he began to see the absurdity in some of his earlier concerns. 
He had worried that his interests wouldn't align with hers because they weren't girly. Yet, as he watched our little one, he realized her world currently revolved around basic things like shapes, colors, and, of course, feeding times. It was amusing to think that he had been married to me for eight years, a woman who shared many of his interests, yet it took the birth of our daughter to drive home the point that interests aren't strictly defined by gender. My niece, bless her heart, is still a handful, but he's come to understand that her behavior, or the complex relationships he has with some of the women in his life, doesn't define all female experiences. I often joke that I should send a bouquet to his therapist for the progress they've made. And about the whole shopping debacle? When he mentioned his fear of shopping for a girl, he wasn't stereotyping. He genuinely felt clueless about shopping for women's clothes. To be honest, even after 32 years of being a woman, I still find women's fashion a mystery. I mean, seriously, where are all the pockets? All this to say, the gender disappointment issue ended up being that he ruined one day I had back in March of this year. He loves our daughter, does not resent her for not being a boy, and didn't leave me over his gender disappointment. I just want other parents experiencing this to know there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you to everyone who weighed in. I felt really validated. Being a parent is not for everyone, and it's crazy how much importance society used to place on gender. I hope that kid will have good parents who love and support them, regardless of their gender. As the youngest sibling in a split family, I found solace in Catholic symbols after a tumultuous upbringing. But when a potential love interest questions my devotion, tensions rise within my stepmother's judgmental realm. Here's how it all went down. So, some background context is required to fully understand my situation. I, 23-year-old male, and I have an older brother, 26-year-old. My mom was old-school Catholic, and my dad was an atheist. My brother and I were raised Catholic, and my dad never minded. When I was about 11, my parents got a divorce, and my dad got custody. My mom changed after the divorce. My brother and I are no contact with her. A little while after, my brother and I started being outspoken atheists to stick it to mom. In reality, my brother was just coming into his own and the church didn't have a place in his life. And I was the younger brother who followed his big brother. My dad almost instantly remarried to a woman I affectionately called the witch as a kid because I didn't know how my dad loved her without her putting a spell on him. She was rude, elitist, gold digging, a total Karen. My father changed because of his wife, but he still loved us and tried his best with us. I will always defend the fact that he was a good father. His only flaw was his taste in women, but he was never the same and always prioritized his wife. As a child, I suffered from night terrors and had trouble sleeping throughout middle school. My stepmother suggested medication and therapy, which wasn't what I needed. I now realize that I have trauma related to my mother's abuse and her encouragement of my brother's suicide. One day, while searching through old boxes, I found my communion cross that had been gifted to me. Due to the nostalgia of a time when I had a real family, I hung it on my wall. For the first time in years, I slept peacefully like a baby. This happened during my sophomore year of high school. I realized that I felt safe around Catholic symbols. Nothing else in my life at that time brought me comfort. So I started going to the local church to escape from home. The congregation accepted me, and I even began apprenticing with a blacksmith who attended the church. By the beginning of my junior year, I had become a born-again Catholic. I wore a cross that I had forged myself every day. On the surface, my father and stepmother were supportive. And if Karen wasn't around, my dad genuinely supported me. He drove me to church and such. However, my stepmother would ask that I not wear a cross when there are guests over. Additionally, one of her favorite things to do is give house tours to show off how much her husband makes and how nice her house is. After I decorated my room with various religious items, she stopped showing off my room, which I didn't mind. She also screamed at me if I ever dared to leave my Bible anywhere outside my room. She would also make snide comments constantly. At 18, I enlisted and served five years in the Marines. Now that I'm back home, I'm staying in my old room until my brother and I can rent an apartment together and I can start college. My stepmom introduced me to the daughter of her friends. She was pretty and nice when I first met her, and it seemed like our mothers were trying to set us up, so I decided to give it a shot. We went on two dates, and although we didn't really connect, I enjoyed experiencing civilian life, so I decided to continue seeing her. However, things started to get complicated when we were planning our third date over text. The only day she was available was Sunday. I told her that I was volunteering on Sunday afternoon. She suggested a breakfast date in the morning, but I explained that I had church. She seemed surprised and said she didn't know I was religious. I simply replied, yeah, I am, and suggested that she could join me in volunteering. I'm helping the church organize a small fair where local artists sell their work to raise money. Since she was an artist, I thought she might enjoy it. However, she declined and stopped texting me. 
That was two days ago. Yesterday I came back from a run to find my stepmom and the girl's mom having brunch. I grabbed some water and had a polite conversation. The topic of the third date came up and they asked why I wouldn't go. Confused, I said I would go, but I had plans on Sunday and we needed to find a new date. I explained what I was doing. My stepmom said in a half-annoyed voice, Oh, you're still on that. I learned at a young age that it was futile to engage with her, so I simply replied, Yeah, I am, and walked away to deal with my frustrations in a productive manner. However, it seems that the mere mention of still being in my religious phase made the girl uneasy. Last night, she knocked on my door and asked to talk, but she barged in before I could refuse. She then proceeded to lecture me about how a girl like her only comes along once in a lifetime, and I shouldn't be spiteful just because she doesn't share my beliefs. This confused me because I was the one who was ignored, and I never did anything to be spiteful. So, I asked her to clarify, and she launched into one of her, my voice is calm, so I'm right, rants about how I should have canceled my plans to take her out that Sunday. She asserted that just because my church says men can treat women however they want, it doesn't mean I can. At that point, I simply left the room. She is impossible to argue with, and if she gets angry, chaos ensues. Since then, my stepmom keeps saying things like, I just lost a good girl over a myth, or women don't like stuck-up men, and as usual, my dad is staying out of it. As for the girl I was set up with, I don't really care. I mean, it's her choice, and honestly, I'm trying to ask out a childhood friend anyway. I think I was just being kind by taking her out. I also don't care that my family is atheist. They have every right to believe what they want. In fact, I served five years to protect that right. Personally, I believe the worst sin one can commit is to deny someone their convictions. However, it's becoming increasingly difficult not to respond. The rest of my family is either supporting her or staying out of it. My step-aunts are sending me atheist articles and other pieces in an attempt to prove that Sky Daddy doesn't exist. I am the only member of my family who is not openly atheist. I am already seen as different for enlisting instead of attending an Ivy League college and not conforming to politics or business. I have asked them to stop, but they are not respecting my wishes because they feel the need to unbrainwash me. It's becoming annoying. I don't want to cut off contact completely because I love my dad, and apparently, they come as a package deal. My brother, being the only rational person, is backing me. He thinks the whole thing is stupid and is putting in more time looking for apartments for us so we can just leave the house. I'm not hopeful that they'll come around and accept me, but I'm not compromising my faith just because my stepfamily wants to be judgmental. Don't mind your family. Everyone has the right to choose whatever they want to believe. It's important to stay true to yourself and your convictions. Surround yourself with people who respect and support your choices. Keep moving forward and don't let the judgment of others deter you. I found myself trapped in a humiliating ordeal when my PE teacher demands I do 100 jumping jacks even if I'm on a wheelchair. Little did I know, this encounter would ignite a journey of empowerment and resilience. Here's how it all went down. So, there I was, sitting in my wheelchair in the middle of the gym, surrounded by the sounds of my classmates getting ready for P.E. class. I've been in a wheelchair since I was a kid, due to a car accident that left me with limited use of my legs. It's something I've learned to live with, but it doesn't make situations like these any less awkward. Karen, our overly enthusiastic P.E. teacher, was at the front, her whistle ready to go. All right, everyone, today's challenge is 100 jumping jacks. Let's get those legs moving and hearts pumping, she announced, her voice echoing through the gym. I glanced around, feeling a sense of unease. I knew I had to speak up. Um, Karen? I called out, trying to catch her attention. Yes, what is it? She responded, her eyes scanning the room until they landed on me. I can't do jumping jacks. I'm in a wheelchair, I said, my voice steady but a bit hesitant. She paused for a moment, looking at me as if I had just suggested we cancel P.E. forever. Well, just because you're in a wheelchair doesn't mean you get special treatment in my class. Move your arms or something. You can still participate, she said, her tone dismissive. I felt my cheeks flush with embarrassment as I started moving my arms, trying to mimic the jumping jacks the best I could. I could feel the eyes of my classmates on me, and I wished I could just disappear. Karen, however, seemed completely unfazed. Come on, put some energy into it. You're not even trying, she shouted, her voice rising above the noise. I stopped, my arms dropping to my sides. Karen, this is ridiculous. I can't do jumping jacks, and yelling at me isn't going to change that. She glared at me, her eyes narrowing. You know, this generation is so entitled. You all want everything handed to you. Well, that's not how the real world works, she said, her voice filled with frustration. I was stunned, not just by her words, but by the fact that she was saying them in front of the entire class. 
I felt a lump form in my throat as I wheeled myself to the side, watching as my classmates continued with the exercise. The rest of the class was a blur, and by the time the bell rang, I was more than ready to leave. I couldn't believe how Karen had treated me, and I was determined to do something about it. The next day, I went to the principal's office and explained what had happened. To my surprise, he was very understanding and promised to talk to Karen about making her classes more inclusive. Over the next few weeks, things started to change. Karen was clearly not happy about having to modify her classes, but she did it. She started including activities that everyone could participate in, even if she did so, begrudgingly. My classmates started to stand up for me too. They made sure I was included in everything and didn't let Karen's stubbornness get in the way of our fun. As the school year went on, Karen's attitude slowly started to change. She wasn't exactly friendly, but she stopped making snide comments and started treating me like the rest of the class. By the end of the year, I had learned a valuable lesson about standing up for myself and the power of collective action. Karen may not have become the world's most understanding PE teacher, but she had learned that she couldn't get away with excluding someone just because they were different. And me? I had learned that I was stronger than I thought and that my voice mattered. So, in the end, I guess you could say that Karen's crazy demand and her accusations of entitlement turned out to be a good thing. It showed me that I had the power to create change even in the face of stubbornness and ignorance. And that's a lesson I'll carry with me for the rest of my life. Wow, what an inspiring story. It's incredible to see how this person faced adversity and stood up for themselves. Karen clearly needed a lesson in empathy and inclusivity. Kudos to the principal for taking action and to the classmates for supporting their fellow student. This is a reminder that we all have the power to make a difference. I never thought it would come to this. The chaos and destruction caused by my stepdaughter's entitled boyfriend, whom I aptly call Wreck-It Ralph, have left us homeless, carless, and adrift. Little did I know that our lives would take such a dark turn. Here's how it all went down. I call my stepdaughter's entitled boyfriend Wreck-It Ralph. No relation to the trademark cartoon, just coincidental naming. He has a tendency to break, ruin, or tear up everything he touches. My stepdaughter, who is actually a sweet and endearing young woman whom I love dearly, has, like many young women with self-esteem issues, allowed herself to be led astray by Wreck-It Ralph. In the year they've been together, she's lost everything. But at 23, she is old enough to learn her lessons without us parents coming to her rescue until she gets rid of Wreck-It Ralph and gets back on track. When they first got together, they lived with her dad and myself for a few months. It very quickly became apparent that Wreck-It Ralph had a chip on his shoulder when it came to me. He would carry tales to my husband causing us to argue, despite my husband telling Wreck-It Ralph many times that it was my house and everything in it was mine. Wreck-It. Ralph would keep asking my husband, not me, if he could have this or that, and that's if he asked. He kept getting more and more animals, despite us telling him no more. Neither of them were taking care of the ones they had. They were not buying dog or cat food or cat litter. That was our responsibility, as my husband and I were taking care of it. They were not taking care of the messes, nor were they training the animals, which resulted in them damaging our belongings. In our state, marijuana is legal, and there is a dispensary in our town. The only work these two individuals were doing was door delivery, her job with a daily payout, solely to earn enough money for Wreck-It Ralph to make a daily purchase at the dispensary and eat at fast food restaurants. Wreck-It. Ralph's animosity towards me was evident when they brought my husband a soda one night, walking right past me through the back door and loudly calling out, we got you uh, your favorite soft drink, to my husband in the living room, completely disregarding my presence. Another instance was when my stepdaughter asked if she could use my debit card to buy drinks for the four of us at a local convenience store on a hot day, when my husband and I were busy unloading things from the truck and trailer in the backyard. This request was not a problem. However, upon checking my account, I discovered that they had spent $1.20 on food for Wreck-It Ralph without asking for permission. The breaking point came when I informed them that they needed to replace the bedroom door that their dog had chewed the bottom of and that I would not allow the pit bull mix they wanted to rescue, despite its history of biting, to enter my home. They then moved to my stepdaughter's mother's home. During their time there, my stepdaughter kept getting tickets in her car, which is only registered to my husband. They weren't paying their insurance, which I had bought my stepdaughter her own policy and paid the startup out of my money when they lived with us and didn't pay the plate renewal. Now her license is suspended, and it cost my husband and me $600 to get the plates, again in his name only, unsuspended. Plus, they had damaged the car, and it needed repairs, so he took it from them. Before her license was suspended, but after the police took the plates from her car, my husband let her use his truck, which was on my insurance policy. Wreck it. Ralph drove it, and he has no license, and blew the motor in it. It is now sitting, and can't be used. I told my husband I would put the car on my insurance for him, but only if he drove it. If he returned it to them, 
I was canceling the insurance, which I've stood by. Nevertheless, wreck it. Ralph called daily, demanding my husband return the car to them once it was legal and fixed. After three weeks, my husband finally said, Look, you jerk, I don't know what it is that you think you're trying to accomplish here, but you're not demanding anything from me, and you're not getting the car back. I may have originally bought it for her before she got with you, but it is my car in my name, and I'm keeping it in lieu of the truck you ruined. Don't call me again about the car. Got it? We had been hearing about ongoing disputes between my husband's ex and Wreck-It Ralph, W-I-R. The situation got so bad that Wreck-It Ralph told my husband's ex-wife to pack her stuff and get out of her own home. On another occasion, he told her to shut up and remember who she's talking to. As a result, we all agreed that it was time to let our daughter hit rock bottom. She wasn't seeing how Wreck-It Ralph had transformed her from a sweet, lovable, well-liked, and responsible girl in a college nursing program to someone with a criminal history and no current prospects. My husband's ex-wife moved in with her boyfriend and turned off the power at the home she had been renting. She even told her former landlord, who she had been longtime friends with, that it wouldn't affect their friendship if he evicted them for squatting since neither of them were on her lease in the first place. When my stepdaughter called wanting to come back, my husband allowed her to, but not Wreck-It Ralph. Now they are staying at a homeless shelter in the town where Wreck-It Ralph's mom lives, and even she won't let them live with her. It's heartbreaking to see her go through this, but this entitled Wreck-It Ralph that she won't let go of has really brought her down. She can do so much better. This guy once told us that he couldn't work at a factory he interviewed at because it was climate controlled and his heart condition won't allow that. Then he argued with me and my husband that climate controlled meant controlled by the climate, so it would be hot in the summer and cold in the winter. We haven't seen him hold a job or do anything useful and productive since they've been together. He just demands from and uses the people who love the girl he's become attached to. Well, we are making progress anyway. My stepdaughter recently had court in a town 30 miles west of us. They are staying just across the state line in a small city 30 miles east of us. So my husband and I devised a plan to get her alone from him. We said the only car running was the two-seat convertible and could only take her for her court appearance. My husband picked her up, then I took her to her court appearance as my husband had to be at the house for something. On the way, she started talking about how she wanted to break up with Wreck-It Ralph, but was afraid of the hurt that comes with it. She hated how controlling and untruthful he was, but felt he truly loved her, and didn't know if the negative behavior was simply from their stressful circumstances. She said once he got SR-22 insurance and his license back, things would be better. I pulled over, pulled out my phone, and went to the court file website for the county north of us, where Wreck-It Ralph used to live. I pulled up six cases in his name, three related to driving with multiple citations in each. The most recent case involved speeding, running a stop sign, hitting a woman, fleeing the scene, having a suspended license and registration, and obviously no insurance. He was arrested later and had to post bond. In that case, he had $4,000 in fines. Plus, we had received a letter at our house from the state stating he owed $11,000 in restitution to the woman for damages and that his license was permanently suspended until the restitution. Any related court-imposed fines and state-imposed reinstatement fee were paid, along with proof of SR-22, within 48 hours of the release of suspension by the state. My husband accidentally opened it. It arrived in a stack of other mail, and he didn't look at the addressee. She was deflated and angry, stating they had talked at length, and he never told her any of that, only that he needed SR-22 because he got caught driving without insurance and had to have it before he could get his license back. As someone who used to have my own insurance sales license, I told her, no, you can't get insurance if your license is suspended or revoked, at least not in our state. He would have to get his license valid, then get insurance for mandated SR-22 reporting. She herself ended up on probation for her driving issues related to him. With a six-month suspension and $750 in fines, lucky break from the judge in all honesty, she too will have to have SR-22 once her suspension is over. Afterwards, while I stopped at the store to get stuff for supper, wreck it, Ralph kept calling and demanding she come back. Despite plans to have supper with her that evening, she ultimately gave in to the relentless calls and asked her dad to take her back before I could cook. I did verify that yes, she has an intrauterine device, IUD, for those who inquired. She was very unhappy with her situation and beginning to see him for what he is and how, in the year they've been together, he has brought her down. However, she's not quite at the point of leaving him, but hopefully, with any luck, she'll be calling to come home soon. She knows she has a place here with us, but he doesn't. The daughter really needs to seek help and leave that guy, otherwise she will completely lose control of her life. It's crucial for her to surround herself with a supportive and caring environment that encourages growth and independence. It may be tough, but with the right support system she can break free from the chaos and reclaim her future.
I never thought a simple family gathering would lead to such a heated confrontation. As the tension filled the room, I couldn't hold back my frustration any longer. With those words hanging in the air, I knew I had crossed a line. Here's how it all went down. My older brother has quite the bustling household, with a mix of stepchildren and biological kids all under one roof. His wife, Tori, brought two kids into the marriage from her previous relationship. And then there's Liam, a 15-year-old from a brief fling, and another child from a long-term relationship. My brother also has a daughter of his own. From our conversations, it seems like Liam is the only one without a dad in the picture. And he's also the one who lives with them full time, while my biological niece spends most of her time with her mom. I initially thought that Liam, being around all the time, would naturally receive a fair share of attention. However, my niece shared some insights that painted a different picture. She mentioned that Tori once referred to Liam as the extra and not as adorable as her other kids, brushing it off as a joke. Fast forward to a recent family dinner at their place, Tori decided it was the perfect moment to share some big news. She clinked her glass, signaling for everyone's attention, and with a beaming smile, she announced, We're expecting! The room instantly filled with cheers and congratulations, and I found myself caught up in the excitement, clapping along with the rest. But amidst the joy, I couldn't help but notice Liam standing at the edge of the crowd, tears welling up in his eyes as he quietly slipped away. Concerned, my niece and I exchanged glances before deciding to follow him out of the room. Finding him in a quieter corner of the house, I gently asked, Hey Liam, is everything okay? The floodgates opened, and he broke down, sobbing into my arms. My heart ached for him. My niece, ever the compassionate one, softly suggested, How about we go grab some ice cream, Liam? It might help take your mind off things. Grateful for her kindness, he nodded, and they headed out, leaving me to return to the party, my mind heavy with concern. Back in the living room, the atmosphere was still buzzing with excitement. I noticed my brother deep in conversation with one of our nephews, a son of our other sibling. Curiosity peaked, I decided to join them, catching the tail end of their conversation. Yeah, I didn't make the team this year, the nephew was saying, a hint of disappointment in his voice. Oh man, that's tough. But hey, there's always next time, right? My brother responded, trying to lift his spirits. True, but you know what's cool? Liam made the team, the nephew added, his tone brightening. My brother looked genuinely surprised, his eyebrows shooting up. Liam? Really? I had no idea he was even into that. I always thought he was more of the quiet, nerdy type. The nephew laughed, shaking his head. Nah, uncle, you've got it all wrong. Liam's actually super popular at school. He's really good at the sport, too. I could see the confusion on my brother's face as he tried to reconcile this new information with his previous assumptions about Liam. It was clear he had a lot to learn about his stepson, and I hoped this revelation would be a step in the right direction. After their chat, my brother came over to me, slightly puzzled, and said, Maybe the nephew got it wrong. Liam isn't really like that. I asked him to elaborate, and he admitted that he doesn't really talk to Liam much, but according to Tori, Liam is socially awkward, sensitive, and a bit clingy. Right on cue, Tori chimed in, Liam, is he bothering you? Just run away next time. He can be such a leech. I was taken aback, especially after witnessing Liam's vulnerability earlier. I couldn't hold back and told them both off, saying they should be ashamed of themselves. I even told Tori that if she didn't want clingy kids, she should have kept her legs closed. Unsurprisingly, I was shown the door, and Tori has been sending me angry messages ever since, accusing me of rudeness and ignorance. Even my mom gave me an earful, but despite all that, I stand by what I said. They're not treating Liam right, and it's just not okay. So am I jerk here? To clarify, Tori has four kids in total. The two oldest share the same father, who is very much present in their lives. Liam's dad, on the other hand, is nowhere to be found. And the fourth child has a different dad, who is also involved. My niece and the new baby, shared between my brother and Tori, bring the total kid count to six. And just to be clear, I'm not letting my brother off the hook. I think he's just as much in the wrong, especially for not taking the time to understand and connect with his stepson. My main issue with Tori stems from her continued negative talk about her own son, which is why I confronted her directly. It appears that Liam may have had more needs as a younger child, such as being hungry, cold, or having ill-fitting shoes, which his sister-in-law had to address. However, it seems that over time, Liam may have shut down emotionally due to a learned helplessness, believing that he won't receive the support he needs from his mom. In this situation, they should support to Liam by being there for him and inquiring about his teams or competitions. They can ensure that he has the necessary support and resources. It may also be beneficial for the OP to have a conversation with her brother regarding Liam's situation. I never expected my marriage to unravel like this. 
From doubts about our daughter's paternity to hidden family secrets, the truth shattered our once happy home. Now, as I prepare to walk away, I reflect on the twists and turns that led me to this moment. Here's how it all went down. My soon-to-be ex-husband, Eric, 40 years old, and I, 38 years old, were high school sweethearts, and we grew up in a small town where the majority of the population was white. Eric is white, and although I do not have the typical appearance of a white woman, I have enough features that I could be considered white passing. I recently discovered I'm of mixed race, which is important later. Eric and I got married after I graduated from high school. I became pregnant when I was 26 and had fraternal twins, now 12, named EJ and Natalie. As the twins grew older, EJ started to resemble Eric with his curly blonde hair and fair skin, while Natalie started to resemble me with her dark wavy hair. However, her skin would get darker, as if she had a permanent tan. Eric and I were confused by this because no one in our families had a similar skin complexion. After college, Eric pursued a career in law enforcement, and we eventually settled into a routine with our twin kids, EJ and Natalie. When the kids were seven, Eric got an opportunity for a promotion, which required us to move to the city. It was a big change for us, but we were excited for this new chapter in our lives. As time went on, I started noticing that Eric would occasionally make prejudiced comments about certain communities. I tried to shrug them off, telling myself they weren't overtly offensive, but deep down I knew it wasn't right. One day, while at a gathering with Eric's co-workers, one of them took a glance at a family photo and casually asked, Is Natalie adopted? She seems to have African-American features. He even went as far as to suggest that maybe I had an affair after conceiving EJ, hinting at the possibility of the twins having different fathers. I was taken aback, but I laughed it off, not wanting to cause a scene. However, the seed of doubt had been planted in Eric's mind. By the time the twins turned 11, he couldn't hold back his doubts any longer. One evening, he sat me down and said, We need to talk. I want a paternity test for Natalie. His voice was firm, and I could see the uncertainty in his eyes. I was hurt, but I agreed, hoping that the test would put his doubts to rest. When the results came back confirming that Eric was indeed Natalie's father, I thought we could move on. But I noticed a change in Eric. He became distant towards Natalie, and it broke my heart. One day, my phone died while I was in the middle of looking up a recipe for dinner, so I grabbed Eric's phone to continue my search. That's when I stumbled upon a support forum where Eric had been venting his thoughts. He was convinced that I had been unfaithful, made derogatory comments about black people, and even suggested that I had somehow tampered with the DNA test results. I was livid. Confronting Eric, I demanded an explanation. He looked me in the eyes and said, There's just no way Natalie can be mine. We need another paternity test. Exhausted and frustrated, I agreed, hoping that this would finally put an end to his doubts. When the results came back, once again confirming Eric as Natalie's father, I was at a loss. That's when I decided to contact my parents, desperate for answers. We danced around the topic for a while until my mom finally broke down and confessed. Your dad is not your biological father, she said, her voice filled with regret. Your real dad was biracial. She showed me an old picture of him, and at first glance, he looked white. But as I stared longer, I could see his African-American features. It turned out I hadn't inherited those genes, but Natalie had. The revelation was shocking, but it also brought a sense of relief. I finally had answers, and I hoped that this would help Eric see that his doubts were unfounded and that he needed to change his attitude, not just for Natalie's sake, but for the sake of our entire family. This seemed to appease Eric, but I could not forget the comments Eric made about black people and told him I wanted a divorce. He apologized and said he couldn't understand at the time, but I told him it was disgusting that that was what he thought about that community, and I refused to raise my children in an environment that fostered and normalized negative thoughts about any community. Eric and my parents tried to get me to rethink my decision and to go to counseling. I agreed to go to counseling, but I am not changing my mind about divorcing him. I wanted to clarify some things first. I'm not sure what you guys mean by my mom lied to me. While she never outright told me that someone else was my biological dad, I never questioned it, so it never came up. She told me she would tell me the truth if I ever asked. And everyone, my grandparents and dad, knew and agreed to tell me the truth if I asked. Not all prejudice is negative, guys. The prejudicial comments my husband made were saying a kid would be great on track after seeing them run, and they happened to be black. Or that a kid would be a good businessman one day, and they were Middle Eastern. It didn't mean anything to me at the time due to my cultural ignorance. With that, my husband gave me no indication that he had certain feelings against other communities. So stop with the, you were okay with him being racist until it was you. Uh. When I mentioned that he was distant with Natalie, I didn't mean to imply that he treated her poorly. 
he simply felt disconnected because he had doubts about her being his biological child, which affected his level of affection towards her. However, they still had interactions. My husband found out about the Reddit post and was mortified because he didn't realize how his behavior made him look. He also says he appreciates the comments that cut him some slack. Anyways, he booked a session with a counselor at his job, found out that cops have on-site therapists for us to go to. We got straight into the issue. The counselor asked why the comments bothered me so much, and I told her that I've seen so many innocent people suffer from hatred for something they didn't do, and how it makes people act way out of character. The degrading and harmful things people would do and say to others based on a characteristic they can't control, and treat them like they were less than human. My husband asked if he thinks he hates me and the kids. I told him I don't know. When it was his turn, he confessed to having an inferiority complex to black men, about how he thought black people were more physically attractive and gifted, and that the girls would have crushes on the black boys. How it hurt that none of the girls would look at them, the white boys. So the boys looked for compensating factors that would make them more desirable, having money, getting careers, not being involved in illegal activity, etc. And it turned into this ugly thing of why like him when I have this. I was floored. I asked him if he was like this when we met, and he said yes, but that I never triggered his insecurities because I didn't pay attention to them or talk to them, but it was always in the back of his head. He was worried I would leave him for them, so he started working out, playing sports, and buying cologne to keep up with them. The counselor asked about the comments, and he said that he was looking for validation of his feelings as far as being good enough. When he considered the thought of me cheating, he couldn't understand how I could choose a menace to society over him that has provided for his family and given us a home. I was numb because I didn't think he felt this way. I told Eric that I want him to write a detailed, heartfelt apology letter to the community he offended. He is not to tell me what it says or show me, but to write it and then post it anonymously. If strangers can forgive him and push him forward to help be better, then I can too. After getting home, Eric wrote the letter, then posted it after proofreading it again and again. He's currently waiting for the comments, and in all honesty, it was enough to make me reconsider divorcing him. He's not off scot-free, but I really appreciate his effort. If anything significant happens, I'll update again. This will be the final update because I'm done. The good news is, you guys were right, and I was a jerk for believing my husband. I am relieved that racism isn't tolerated or accepted by the majority despite what you may think. After my husband wrote this apology letter, he received support from people telling him that they were proud he was able to admit his racism and that he was willing to change. I was willing to work through this, seeing that other people could forgive him, and so on. A day or two later, I was using our iPad and received a notification for a text from mom. I looked at it and didn't recognize the conversation until I realized it wasn't my mom, it was my mother-in-law. I'm assuming my husband forgot to sign out of his Apple ID, so it was linked to his account. I read the text that my mother-in-law was disappointed that I and my kids happened to be of African-American descent and that she didn't expect this for her family, but that we were tricked and we are one of the good ones. My husband said he couldn't believe it either, but it's not my fault my mother lied about having relations with someone of African-American descent and that he was going to make sure our kids don't become one of the bad ones always on the news. My husband still maintained his negative attitudes, as I previously posted in other texts with his mother. I realized there was no hope for him to change, so I am leaving my husband now. I keep in contact with one of the wives of my husband's former co-worker who moved to another city, and I explained everything to her. They will allow me to stay with them until I can find somewhere for me and my kids to live since they have the room. I do have a job, so I do not rely on my husband for my income. Sorry for disappointing everyone when my husband gave me that false story and fake tears. In hindsight, even then I shouldn't have believed it. I just wanted to believe there was hope that my husband wasn't racist, but we live and learn. This will be my final update because I'm exhausted and my only focus is on my kids. If he cares so much about your ethnicity and holds such negative attitudes, then you are absolutely right to leave him. Your decision to prioritize your well-being and the well-being of your children is commendable. Remember, you deserve to be in a loving and supportive environment. Stay strong, and I wish you all the best in this new chapter of your life. If you enjoyed today's stories, check out the other videos on your screen now. Submit your own stories at you'rethejerk.com. Subscribe now, or you're definitely the jerk.